Uh, the doctors have prognosed my uh, knee to be doing real, really well. I got off my crutches uh, two weeks ago, and they said I have to continue to wear this, a brace for about five more weeks. And um, I started my rehabilitation. I'm getting a whirlpool and uh, electric stimulation. But things are going good right now. And if my knee heals the way it's supposed to be, hopefully I can get a shot of playing professional football somewhere because I love it. All right, let's talk about this game. John, a night before a big game, the Cotton Bowl, you were at the Rose Bowl two years ago. How tough is it to get to sleep? How tough is it not to be thinking about that game the whole time? Uh, you think about it constantly. Uh, we, we got out here the day after Christmas, and ever since then, it's been, the game has been on our minds. It's very tough to go to sleep uh, the day after the game, the day before the game, because uh, it, people, are, our team is so pumped up, and they're just, the energy is just flowing throughout the entire uh, Ohio State football organization. And when it comes to kickoff time, they're going to be ready. A lot of fans were worried that the team wasn't going to be up for it. I saw Chris Spillman. You saw him. He had the hat with war on it. You were in the locker room. Quickly, what's the feeling like on this team? It's energetic. Uh, it's like electricity flowing. Uh, we feel that Texas A&M has a great ball club, but we think that we, ha we can outman Texas A&M. It's going to be a close game, but the Buckeyes are going to be ready, and I look for us to pull it out. Good conditions today? Great conditions. It's nice, about 50 degrees. It's uh, mild, a clear sky, so we're looking for a great afternoon. John, thanks for joining us live. Senior tailback John Wooldridge out of Akron, and now we're going to go back to Columbus where Don once again is with some of those players who have played in bowl games and also can play. Eligibility may be up just a little, Dom. Well, Barry, I'll tell you what, uh, there, you don't get much bigger than this guy right down here, Vic Janowitz, who won the Heisman Trophy with Ohio State back in 1950. And, uh, Vic, first of all, you played in uh, some bowl games, and you know what's going through the players' head. Uh, what, what do you think they're thinking right now as, as we get close to game time? Well, they're just looking for a victory. They don't want to come back to Columbus with a defeat under their hands, so uh, they have to be the, play the best football game they've played while a collegiate ball player. So uh, victory is what they, what's in their mind, just like we're... Uh, Looking forward to here this afternoon. I know you've been following the Buckeyes quite a bit uh, this year. What about Texas A&M? What do you think the key is going to be in this contest? I think it'll be between the two quarterbacks. Uh, our quarterback, Cursantes, has a little more age, maturity, and I hope that will win over uh, Texas A&M for us. Although you have to say uh, Texas A&M is rated higher than Ohio State in the national polls, so it's going to be a very close game. So uh, the uh, spread is about two points, and that's going to be that close and it go either way. Go Bucks. You think they're going to win, though? Well, I'm not going to commit myself there, but I hope, I hope they do. All right, Vic Janowitz, 1950 Heisman Trophy winner for Ohio State. Let's head back down to Dallas with Barry Brickman. Over to Dana, Dominic. Over to Dana. That's okay. The fans are moving right on into the Cotton Bowl here. Aggie fans, Buckeye fans, this has been a busy week for the Buckeye fans. Everything from seeing where the Dallas TV show is filmed to going to Texas barbecues. The Buckeye fans have been having a great time in the Lone Star State. This is the week we called Dallas home. From the shiny skyscrapers downtown out to the ranch. You could hear it like a Texas Yahoo. Buckeye fans were raring to go. It's been several days on the run. You'd see scarlet and gray all over the city of nearly a million, give or take a few thousand OSU fans. And while there was plenty of cheering, there were some emotional moments, too. At Elm and Houston streets, where President John Kennedy was shot, 23-year-old memories came back to life. At that time, it just seemed so far from you and so distant. And now it just brings it, that makes it very real. The nightlife was flashy. In Fort Worth, the marching band and some moms and dads whooped it up at Billy Bob's Honky Tonk. There was shopping, of course, at the famed and fancy Neiman Marcus department store and in the trendy Weston Marketplace, where you could even buy Buckeye Bears. In the Cotton Bowl yesterday, some fans got a sneak peek of the marching band, and the Texas A&M band director let the Buckeyes know he's a big fan of theirs. I'll tell you what, I just don't remember hearing a band any better than this one. You guys are great. The pool looks a little smaller, and so is the house. But being at South Fork for some Buckeye fans is the second most popular part of this week. Second, of course, to today's football game. The biggest party of the week filled a hotel ballroom, wall to wall with scarlet and gray. Have you been the Dallas hospitality? No question about it, that they have just turned out the entire city for us. And, and they have welcomed us with open arms. They're pleased and delighted that, we, that Ohio State is here. 
They said goodbye to 1986, and they hope to sing in 87 with a Buckeye win this afternoon. Thanks, Dana. When we come back to Dallas Live, we'll take a look at these two teams, the key personnel, Ohio State and Texas A&M, and how they got here. Live, the countdown to Cotton. Don't go away. We are live in Dallas as we count down to the Cotton Bowl Classic, and right behind me is the Cotton Bowl. Just how did these two teams get here for this sold-out crowd? Well, let's take a look. Dom Tiberia and I will take a look at Texas A&M and Ohio State. For the 1986 season, Earl Bruce was determined to make the ground game his number one weapon. Nobody wanted three yards in a cloud of dust. This year, it averaged out 4.2 yards a carry and a wisp of turf. Vince Workman was the man doing the most work. 985 yards, seven touchdowns, an average of five yards a carry. Workman became a starter in the backfield when John Woldridge was injured in the kickoff classic. But there were games in midseason when Workman lost his starting job to a freshman. Jim Bryant had come to Ohio State from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and was given number 41. An awfully tough position taking the number of Keith Byers, with the old number 41 still fresh on Buckeye minds. But Bryant responded quite well, almost 700 yards. And always there was the power running and bulldozer blocking of dependable fullback George Cooper. In all, almost 2,400 yards on the ground in 1986 for the Scarlet and Gray, and those numbers are going to be priority one for the Texas Aggie defense. Well, they run the trap and the power and the sweep. Uh, you know, we, we better be able to stop the run or it's going to be a long day. You know, uh, hopefully we can slow them down and, and get the ball to us as much as they get. In the air, the Buckeyes are led by a member of their own alumni association, quarterback Jim Carsadas, now an OSU grad. His favorite target is All-American wide receiver Chris Carter. Carter's dazzling receptions and acrobatic moves to open ground make him a defender's nightmare. He scored 11 touchdowns this season. Senior linebacker Larry Kelm of A&M adds up the Ohio State offense this way. They look like they're going to be a big physical team, and they, they like to come at you, and uh, we're going to be ready for them because they're going to, they, they like to run the football, and uh, they uh, have run a lot of play-action passes, and uh, it's going to be a challenge for us. On defense, Ohio State is anchored by its other junior All-America, linebacker Chris Spielman. An almost unheard of total in one season, Spielman was in on 194 tackles. The Buckeyes' second leading tackler is their senior captain, Sonny Gordon. 89 tackles and a team-leading six interceptions. Boy, they are an outstanding defensive football team. They have great team speed. They have tremendous size. Uh, uh, we were talking to our guys today about scouting report, and their defensive ends are 6'6 six, six and 6'4, six, and, and, of course, their linebacker super. He runs uh, he, he reminds me a lot of Johnny Holland on our side because he runs like Johnny. He's fast, and, and he makes big plays, and he's exciting to watch, and they're good. Junior quarterback Kevin Murray may not be a household name here in the Buckeye State, but down in Texas, he's as big as they come, especially in his hometown of Dallas. Murray is an excellent passer. This year alone, he has thrown for well over 2,400 yards and 17 touchdowns. What makes him so tough to cover is that he's a scrambling quarterback. If no one's open, he won't hesitate to take off. Obviously, you've got to really contain him so he doesn't get out and, and uh, throw on the run, but uh, he's, a, he's a passer that wants to get the ball off rather quickly, and they throw a lot of short passes, and uh, then they run with the football. They've, they, they are really a controlled passing team uh, with a lot of different formations, and and especially a lot of trip formations where they put a lot of receivers on the line of scrimmage. What you have to do is uh, prepare like we played, uh, prepared for with a, a Robbie Bosco type or a Chuck Long type, or that's, which will scramble. And you have to lock up receivers as he's running because his receivers know what to do once he starts scrambling when they come back for the ball. And you can't really attack him or he'll throw the, dump the ball over your head. So you have to try to hook up with receivers while he's running. The Aggie backfield is blessed with two fine running backs. Fullback Roger Vick is big and strong. He goes 6'3", 221 pounds. But don't let his big size fool you. He has plenty of speed, too. This year, he's rushed for 1,001 yards and 10 touchdowns. Tailback Keith Woodside presents a double threat to the Buckeyes. 
He's not only a good runner with 586 yards this year, but he's also a tremendous receiver. Woodside has caught 52 passes this year for 603 yards and five touchdowns. The Texas A&M defense is anchored by two superb inside linebackers. Senior Johnny Holland leads the team in tackles with 147. Like OSU's Chris Spielman, Holland just seems to be in on every tackle. His counterpart is senior Larry Kelm. He's ranked second on the team in total tackles with 118. Both Holland and Kelm have great mobility to the ball. And when they get to the ball carrier, they definitely know what to do. They've got real good inside linebackers and they run real well. They uh, they like to play a lot of man-to-man -man defense because they've got so much speed back there and they think that they have a, a good set of defensive backs where they can cover people like that. I think uh, you know, what we have to do is keep them off balance and uh, try to beat them up the middle instead of trying to run, outrun them. They are uh, basically a, 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 a control the line of scrimmage uh, linebacker team that they run and hit and uh, they do it exceptionally well. Johnny Holland uh, a year ago when I saw him against Auburn I thought he was exceptional in a cotton bowl and uh, he's an exceptional athlete there. They've got a lot of good athletes on their football team and especially on the defensive field where they run and hit. All right Earl Bruce talking about those Texas Aggies and he'll be kicking off in just a few minutes but now let's go back live across Cotton Bowl Plaza. A few folks that made the trip down. Let's go to Dana. Well, we are here with a lot of Ohio State Buckeye fans. We told you about those who came here earlier. These guys came from Columbus, and you got here when? Last night at 2 o'clock in the morning. New Year's Eve, and you were on the road. Yep, we had a little bit of champagne and celebrated at a truck stop. <laughs> <laughs> you going to be ready to celebrate this afternoon? Oh, yeah. We're ready. Buckeyes are going to do well? We're going to win. We're going to win. <laughs> they win big. Go Bucks! All right. Okay. The Aggies. Okay, now... What about this afternoon after the game? Are you going to go back to Columbus tonight? After no. The no, we're going to show Texas how you party Columbus style. No. <laughs> now, they all have their, their Buckeye memorabilia every place here, right, guys? What do you have I here? Have a button that sings the fight song. <laughs> <laughs> and the T-shirt says, what shirt says? I say, Buckeyes, Buckeyes, Buckeyes. And Ray Lucas wanted to tell everybody how long he's been a Buckeye fan. I've been a high State fan so long. When I was born, and the doctor smacked me on the bottom. I didn't cry. I sang the fight song. <laughs> yeah! And as we say goodbye here, let's give them one big cheer. <laughs> okay, Barry, back to you. All right, Dana, this is one of the souvenirs you could buy. Well, you can buy us. Some of the souvenirs the fans can't buy up in Columbus unless we get it for them. When we come back, we have a very special guest live with Dom back in Columbus. He'll need no introduction, so we'll just wait till we come back. We're live for the Cotton Bowl Countdown. Stay with us. We are live in Dallas, about five minutes away from the CBS broadcast, and Dom is live with us again over at Sportsers with a very special guest. Dom, take it away. Well, what, well Barry, uh, first of all, this next gentleman here needs really no introduction. Anyone who's a Buckeye fan knows who this fellow is, of course. Woody Hayes, who was with the Buckeyes for, for many, many years, led him to many national championships. Coach, first of all, how do you see this game? What do you see the key as uh, for the Buckeyes? Well, it's going to be a very rugged football game with the size line, the size fullback they've got, the size quarterback and all of that. It'll be rugged as the devil. And Ohio State will be outweighed, but they will not be outplayed. Coach, Coach, Coach Earl Bruce has the great ability to bring his team up for a ball game. And after their great disappointment against Michigan, that two-point disappointment, you can bet he'll bring them back. It'll be tough because they'd rather be playing in the Rose Bowl. There's no question about that. All right, Coach. All right. That's Coach Hayes. And you're saying they're going to win, right? Yes, they'll win. You bet. All right. I like, I like to go against all of these columnists. All of them have picked Texas A&M, our local columnists, and all of them. To heck with them. No. <laughs> All right, Coach Woody Hayes, he says the Buckeyes will win. Let's head back down to Dallas and Barry. All right, Dom, you got a wild crowd there, huh? Okay, Dom, live from sports. Just come on in here. Dana, just uh, your impressions of your week so far in Dallas, because I know you've been very busy checking out this city. Well, I have been busy. I've had a great time. 
quiet here. Everybody's inside the Cotton Bowl. Game time is a few moments away, and we will be back live from Dallas on Eyewitness News at 6 o'clock tonight. And you know what, Dana? We're still looking for our first cloud. Not a cloud in the sky, Columbus. No gloves either, but we'll find out about that tomorrow. Thank you. Hey, we you. hope you've enjoyed our coverage from here in Dallas to show you what's not only going on in Dallas, but with this team. Happy All right. New Year. Kick off is next for the Cotton Bowl. See you later. Down to Cotton has been brought to you by Khan's Potato Chips. 50 years of making goes into every bag of potato chips. Carriagetown Chrysler Plymouth Dodge. The best deals in Ohio are in Delaware at Carriagetown Chrysler Plymouth Dodge. Also by Lennox, the efficiency experts. And by Bob Evans. Some of the best cooking you'll have is the cooking you'll have at Bob Evans. from Dallas, a city which is once again dressed in maroon and white, the colors of Texas A&M, a program whose legacy was etched by men like Bear Bryant. They meet the scarlet and gray of Ohio State, whose standard of excellence was set by the great Woody Hayes. A&M's 12th man cheered John David Crow to a Heisman Trophy in 57. An entire state watched four Buckeyes win the Heisman, amongst them the only two-time winner, Archie Griffin. Today, the champions of the Big Ten come to Texas, led by the dangerous passing combination of quarterback Jim Carsados to All-American Chris Carter. Not since the great Paul Warfield has Ohio State had such a talented wide receiver. The heart and soul of the Buckeye defense is linebacker Chris Spielman from Massillon, Ohio. He led Ohio State in tackles with 167, including a record 29 tackles against Michigan. Once again, Jackie Sherrill has led A&M to the promised land and did it in a big way with the big play. All Southwest Conference quarterback Kevin Murray has a host of receivers from which to choose, including Keith Woodside. This should be a dandy as the Big Ten co-champs meet the Southwest Conference champions live from the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. CBS Sports presents the 51st annual Cotton Bowl Classic. Live from the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas, it's the Ohio State Buckeyes, co-champions of the Big Ten, versus the Texas A&M Aggies, champions of the Southwest Conference. Today's game is sponsored by Cotton Incorporated for America's Cotton Growers. John Hancock Financial Services, real life, real answers. The heartbeat of America, today, Chevrolet. And by Budweiser, Beechwood aged for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. We have been blessed with sunny skies on this first day of the new year and an excited crowd that might reach record numbers is making its way into this venerable stadium. They have come from Massillon and Middletown, from Cleveland and Columbus. They have come to show allegiance to the scarlet and gray of the Ohio State University Buckeyes. They have come from Brownsville and Dumas, from Seguin and Sonora. They have come here from El Paso and Houston wearing the maroon and white of the beloved Texas A&M Aggies. They have come to Dallas, more than 75,000 of them, for the 51st annual Cotton Bowl Classic. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Vern Lundquist, and Happy New Year from all of us at CBS Sports. Welcome to the Cotton Bowl for this historic first postseason meeting 
between these two schools with such great football traditions. Back in the heat of mid-August, both of these teams had legitimate national championship aspirations. Ohio State was derailed rather quickly with back-to-back -back losses to Alabama and Washington, their worst start in 90 years. But they came back to win nine in a row before losing by two to Michigan. Texas A&M fell off the track almost as quickly, losing a season opener to LSU, but they won eight of their next nine, the only blemish, a three-point loss at Arkansas. Ohio State comes here as co-champs of the Big Ten. Texas A&M arrives again as champions of the Southwest Conference. These are two excellent football teams. I have been joined this afternoon by former Notre Dame head coach Eric Parsegian and former Southern Cal and Los Angeles Ram quarterback Pat Hayden. Era, you've spent much of the season watching Ohio State. What is your impression of them offensively? Well, since Earl Bruce has been at uh, Buckeye land in a sense, basically an I formation team, not overly complicated, but they strive for execution, error-free football, and certainly the turnover ratio is demonstration of the soundness of that philosophy. They're plus 22, which is really remarkable. The two key players offensively that make their team go is Jimmy Carsadas, a quarterback, an outstanding football player, and Chris Carter, who has 65 receptions. These two people will be important in this ballgame. What about them gets your attention on defense? Well, defensively, they're basically a 3-4-4. Most of the college teams are using it. It's bend but don't break, and certainly they give a lot of yardage in between the 20s. But when their goal line is challenged, they're only giving up 15 points a game, which is very good. The two key players that will be important, I think, Chris Spielman, their inside linebacker, All-American, Eric Comoro, their sack leader at the outside backer. Patrick Hayden has spent most of the last month minutely examining Texas A&M. What impresses you about the Aggies, Pat? Well, they are entertaining in offense. They average 440 yards a game in offense, and philosophically what they're trying to do is spread the defense out, make you defend the entire 53-yard width of the field. And then they try to create matchups by using a lot of different formations. Today they want to get Ron Bernstein, Ron Bernstein, their tight end, and Keith Woodside, the halfback, one-on-one -on, -one on linebackers and strong safety. These two have caught 117 passes between them from Kevin Murray. So the, all those shifts and all those things create some problems for defenses. Anything about them defensively that gets your fancy? Well, they play a base 34 as well, but they like to come after you. A lot of strong safety blitz. This really ought to be a very exciting and entertaining matchup. Ohio State and Texas A&M will return to the Cotton Bowl in Dallas right after this. There's a familiar sound, the fight song of the Ohio State University. Earl Bruce and the Buckeyes are here. Jackie Sherrill and the Aggies are here. Our man Pat O'Brien is here. Let's go down to him right now. Happy New Year, Patrick. Thank you, Vern, and Happy New Year to you. You know, one of the things about a bowl game are distractions, and perhaps the biggest distraction for Texas A&M this week was speculation that Jackie Sherrill would take the job at Alabama vacated by Ray Perkins. Now, indeed, officials at Alabama told me yesterday that Jackie Sherrill was very high on their list. This morning, we have learned that some Alabama people called Jackie Sherrill. And shortly after that phone call, I met with Sherrill for about a half an hour. He told me he told them no. He has also told his team he is staying at Texas A&M. Sherrill told me that the Alabama job simply isn't as good as the Texas A&M job. Now, depending on who you talk to, there are still a group of people who say that Jackie Sherrill will end up at Alabama. But as for the pregame anyway, Sherrill says he's staying at Texas A&M. Let's go back upstairs. All right, Pat. And, of course, Jackie Sherrill has his team in the Cotton Bowl for the second consecutive year, something that the Aggies have desired for a century. And moments ago, Jackie Sherrill spoke with his Texas A&M football team in the locker room. The rumination you've had to get here, it's not easy to repeat. You've earned the right to be here, and it's not easy to repeat. And everybody, you're the champion of the Cotton Bowl until we finish this ballgame. And you'll be the champion until the next year if you do the things inside. It's like in this conference. <clears throat> you had the, the character to continue. There's no question about the inside strength of everybody in this football team. And you go back and you look at each one of you and you look at the feelings that you have for each other. And when you play a game, it's not one individual, it's everybody. And I'm talking about everybody on the football team, really, if you play one down, that's your role, that's your responsibility. You play 60 of them or 80 of them, or you don't play at all. So all together. That was Jackie Sherrill just moments ago. On 50 previous afternoons such as this, great teams and great stars have stood nervously on this very same ramp. Teams like Alabama and Penn State and Nebraska and Notre Dame. 38 visiting teams in all. Men like Sammy Baugh and Doak Walker and Jim Brown and Roger Staubach. But until today, until this moment, 
No team from the Big Ten has ever been on this field on New Year's Day. And so for the first time in Cotton Bowl Classic history, with a crowd of 75,000 urging them on, here come the Buckeyes of the Ohio State University. In the previous half century, only one Southwest Conference team has captured back-to-back -back Cotton Bowl titles. That was Darrell Royals' Texas teams of 69 and 70. So now, attempting to accomplish what has been done only once before by a Southwest Conference champion, the champions this year of the Southwest Conference, the Aggies of Texas A&M University and their head coach, Jackie Sherrill. His career record in bowl games going back to his head coaching days is Pittsburgh, five and one. And I don't know how anybody could want to be anywhere at where we are right now. This is terrific. Era, what do you see as the key to this ball game? Well, I think it's the Ohio State Buckeye defensive football team. The Aggies have been just unbelievable offensively. They've set every record there is, both individually and, uh, and collectively as a team. It's remarkable. And that just didn't happen by chance. Good coaching, good players. So the question is, can Spielman stop Vic? Can Comero get the Murray? And of course, can the Buckeyes slow down this great offensive football team? Patrick, would you concur? Well, I would agree, but as good as A&M is on, on in offense, they, they have a lot of tendencies. In third and four or more, they throw the ball 90% of the time. So Ohio State will use more five and six defensive backs than they have all season long. How well their nickel defense plays against the tight end, Bernstein, and Woodside, the halfback, I think is the key. Well, I would agree. I'll make a three for three. I think the defense of Ohio State is the key. Earl Bruce has not been happy with his defense the last half of the season. We're about ready for the coin toss at the center of the field. The seniors and the teams meeting there will be back in Dallas right after this. Okay. And now one of the great college songs in the country, The Spirit of Aggieland from Texas A&M University. song written by an A&M student while keeping watch in the Rhine in World War I. One of the great traditions of Texas A&M. Well, we have a young man who knows a little bit about those traditions. As a matter of fact, before he got concerned about the vagaries of network television, he was once the host of the Jackie Sherrill Show. That's why he was at the University of Houston. Here's Jim Nance. All right, Fern. You know, if there's one thing I remember back from the fall of 1982, that year of working with Jackie Sherrill, the lasting impression was the Texas A&M fans. They might be the most active or vocal fans at all of college football. You know, last night they held a midnight yell practice. Some 30,000 fans gathered for that event. It is not a pep rally, but literally a yell practice, a ritual that takes place prior to all A&M home games. And the practice is just what it says. They get together and rehearse all of the game yells and songs that'll be performed in the game the next day. Now, all Aggies in good standing are expected to have those memorized come game time. 
One other tradition that we'll see throughout the day today, Aggie students will stand through the duration of the game. The only time they'll give their feet a rest is when the Ohio State Marching Band performs at halftime. We're about ready to get this one underway, so let's go back upstairs. All right, Jim, stay warm. It's uh, a little bit nippy today. The temperature is 51 degrees. The wind could be important. It comes out of the north at 13 miles per hour. Humidity 52% of the forecast sunny. And the games have begun to be played because A&M won the coin toss. They deferred their option till the second half. That left the option up to Ohio State. Earl Bruce said, we will take the wind. So Earl Bruce's team will kick off with the wind behind them. And the Aggies will return. I did that on many occasions, uh, Vern, because I felt early in the game when your team's a little bit nervous, I'd rather have the opposition go 80 yards if I can put it in the end zone. But again, you're going against the number three offensive team in the nation. If you believe in your defense, it's a good call. Freshman Pat O'Moro will kick off for Ohio State. He was the regular field goal kicker for the Buckeyes until midseason when he lost that job to Pat France, Matt France and Rod Harris. Averaging 18.8 yards per return will receive for Texas A&M. Sophomore from Dallas. Referee today is Jim Garvey. And we're just about set. Garvey joined by Ron Plagas, Bill Cronin, Jerry Height, Joe Shirk, Joe Klingensmith, and Mike Donato. They are members of the Collegiate Independent Football Officials Association. Omoro, a freshman from Radford, Virginia. And for the first time in Cotton Bowl Classic history, a member of the Big Ten is a visiting team. Rod Harris at the one. To the 21, where he is filled by the Ohio State Buckeyes, Sonny Gordon, number seven, defensive co-captain. Now, let's meet the Ohio uh, the a and offense. Well, the backfield is very difficult to defend because of different types of weapons. Murray, the quick thrower. Roger Fick, 220 pounds, right up the middle. Woodside, a tremendous receiver, 52 receptions. And, of course, B Bernstein, the tight end, likes to work the middle. Tony Thompson filling in for Rod Harris today. Walker, very good on corner routes. First down, 10, Kevin Murray, player of the year in the Southwest Conference. And this team averages 440.2. Murray will throw into the wind on first down. Left side incomplete. Intended for Keith Woodside, who has caught 52 passes out of the backfield this year. How about the offensive line? It's a real good unit, Vern. What they are big enough to pass protect big tackles. They can push those defensive ends right past the quarterback. And they're also big enough, really, to match up, go hat against hat, open up some big holes for Vic, the big 220-pound fullback. As you look at the size, watch Marshall Land, 340 pounds. Largest man in college football. He's down from 370. Refrigerator could take a lesson. <laughs> Second down and 10. And again, Murray will throw a little flip right side to Rod Bernstein, number 29, who is the leading pass receiver for the Aggies with 65 catches this year. The tackle made by the All-American Chris Spielman. We talked a little bit about Marshall Land, 340 pounds, but watch how good his feet are. And watch how he pushes the defensive bat and the defensive man right inside. He knows it's a screen to his outside. He pushes 14, come row to the inside. That's a good block, but good reaction by the Ohio State defense. He had his hand on him. Didn't he have a little holding there? Didn't need to at 340. <laughs> Kevin Murray, a year ago, MVP here with 292 yards, faces a third and 12. Opening sequence of the ball game. Blitz is coming. They'll do that all day, and Bernstein burns them. All the way to the 43. It's a gambling defensive scheme that Earl Bruce has decided upon today. Well, the history of Ohio State is not a blitzing type of football team. But in this case, they try, and right off the bat, you see that Bernstein takes advantage of it, and they hit him one-on-one -on -one right now. That Kevin, is a gain of 23. Excuse and me, Kevin Pat. Murray did a sensational job off the rush. He felt the blitz, and he actually threw this off his back foot. You see that? Big rush there. Read the blitz beautifully, and that's one of the matchups we talk about. Bernstein against the nickel defense of Ohio State. First down and 10, Texas A&M from the 43. And off Roger Vick. Across midfield to the Ohio State 47. Tackle made by David Brown. 
number 43, Roger Vick. There is to the Ohio Chris Fieldman, he is one of the key factors, as Eric Parsegan said at the top of the show. Now, he gets rid of a lot of players early, but here he gets tied up inside by his, actually his own man, and Roger Vick just read his tackles block Lewis Cheek on the left-hand side, and, and Vick is a great inside runner from tackle to tackle. Spielman got caught up in traffic. 13 minutes remaining in the first quarter. Good A&M drive thus far. Bernstein in motion and Murray to throw. Five-man rush across the middle and incomplete. Flag is thrown. Michael Key, number 30, defending. Call interference on Key. There is a flag down on the play. Here's Jim Garvey. Now, Eric, introduce us to this Ohio State defense. Well, it's a very young defensive football team. The, the three down people, there's only one senior in there. And, of course, they're a football team that the strength of this ball club, there's the only senior right there, is in their, in their linebackers. Camaro, the leading sack man at the outside back. All-American Chris Spielman, who's a great player. Michael Key, who just had that interference call, is the only senior in that group. Derek Eisman, the other outside linebacker, who's intercepted three passes. And in the secondary, you've got, this is probably the most underrated secondary. They've picked off 18 passes during the course of the year. And the key is Sonny Gordon, who's had six of them, and is the number two tackler on the Ohio State Buckeye defensive team. Sonny Leach, a linebacker, number eight, has come in for Ohio State. See if that changes their defensive scheme. And off to Roger Vick. First down, A&M at the 32. Scott Leach made the tackle. We have seen A&M come out here in this opening drive, Vern, and use about four or five different formations. Again, that's what they're trying to do. They get your defense thinking about formations, and then they hammer Roger Vick right at you at 220 pounds. And unless the defensive line, the down three from Ohio State, can hold up, you're going to see a lot of Roger Vick. No score, 12.40 remaining first quarter, and the Aggies have a first down at the Ohio State 32-yard line. Roger Vick again, big hole to the 25. Eric Kummerow, number 14, catches up with him. But Vick is finding a lot of room to run up that soft middle. We talked about all the offensive sets. They've used some motion. They've spread the defense out. Here's the second play of the game. You're going to see a man coming across the backfield. Again, trying to create defensive adjustments. The third play, you see them spread out. They're spreading the entire width of the football field. And then the last formation, they spread the tight end out in the slot formation. And here's a quick pitch to Roger Vick. Does a high hurdle and is inside the 20 to the 19. Another Aggie first down, Kumaro and Brown with the tackle. You can understand why Vick has 960 yards coming into this football game. He's their tailback, really, even though he's named as a fullback. He's a single back back there. Big and strong and tremendous speed and a great career here at the Aggie land. 960 this year and a career total of better than 2,400 yards for Texas A&M. Murray threw early on first down without success. Now he's kept it on the ground. It's first and 10 at the 19. He'll throw again. Good job of looking off the play, but he throws into double coverage on the right side. The pass intended for Keith Woodside and Jackie Sherrill on the sideline. What AM likes to do inside their 20-yard line is run men in motion, particularly their flanker, and try to again and get try to get those matchups with the chains and formations. The flanker back, Tony Thompson, is a favorite receiver down here, and again the tight end, Bernstein. From the eye this time on second and ten. Pitch out Woodside. Breaks the tackle. Spins out of another. It'll be at the 15-yard line. Third down coming up. Well, I think he put a move on Spielman that time. It looked like he stepped Spielman was going to step right in there and make that play for no game. And he really put a move on him. Watch Chris Spielman. Take a look at him right here. Spielman's lined up at that inside linebacker. He looks like he's wiping off. He did get knocked down. I guess he got blocked. I guess it was another defender in there that made him really miss. Third down and five. Bernstein in motion. Murray looks his way, fires it toward him, incomplete. Oh, oh. Had him there, and threw it too high. AM got just the matchup we wanted. They had Tony Thompson in motion there, and number 29, Bernstein, right there. See the blitz? 
See the blitz in the corner side there? Right against the defensive back number three, Sean Bell was open. Murray threw it a little bit earlier than he had to. What's this we? You got a mouse in your pocket? <laughs> I think I've heard that I before. Had, <laughs> I had that last time. <laughs> I thought you went to Southern Cal. Here is Scott Slater, 100 points this year as a place kicker in the Southwest Conference, and he gets it, the former walk-on. The sophomore from Fort Worth gets his 22nd field goal this year, and the Aggies have an early lead. Perhaps a record crowd gathered in the sunshine on the first day of 1987 at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. Aggies have a 3-0 lead, an impressive drive, and now another of the traditions at Texas A&M, this one more recent, the 12th man is on the field. These 12 are recruited from the student body. They are all non-scholarship players. They usually perform only at home games, but they do make this one road trip when A&M plays in the Cotton Bowl. This was an idea Jackie Sherrill came up with after meeting some of the students at a bonfire prior to a Texas game. Impressive opening drive there by A&M. And what I liked about that, Burn is they ran on passing downs and passed on running downs. They had a couple of second and shorts where they threw the ball downfield. And also they had open receivers. Bernstein was open and dropped the ball and what would have been a touchdown. I was surprised to see Ohio State blitz right there. That's not their history. They've been basically a zone team, but they decided to stop this offense, which is really a devastating one. They had to take some chances and they were burned in that drive. Scott Slater kicks off for the Aggies. The deep men are Everett Ross, number five, and Jamie Holland, number six. Script kick picked up at the 23, and they come right, and what a collision at the 28. Mm. And there's an example of this enthusiasm by these 12 non-scholarship players. Actually, uh, 11, 10 on the field. I'm thinking 12 men. Middleton, right there in the middle of your screen, he is the captain of the 12th man. And I tell you, they, he had goosebumps the other day when I was talking to him about this. He gave everything he has, this whole team does. It means an awful lot. Now it gives their defense some enthusiasm as well. Tackle was made by number nine, Ronnie Glenn. Here comes Ohio State. They've had big first quarters throughout the year. Jim Carsados with his backs in the eye. George Cooper and Vince Workman, the sophomore. And Carsados will throw. Left side, pass is complete. Chris Carter, the All-American wide receiver, is knocked out of bounds by Jamie Flowers, number 15. Now, let's meet the Ohio State offense. Well, this is a very balanced offensive football team. Unlike the teams of past Buckeyes where they ran the ball more often than they passed it, now they're about a 50-50 team. Vince Workman right there has had three consecutive 100-yard games. He's the runner. The passer, of course, is Carsadas. And the great receiver is Chris Carter, 65 receptions, 27 career touchdown passes. Makes the catch on first down. It'll be second down and three. Three nothing. A&M leads. Jamie Holland is the motion man. The option play. A late pitch. They work it left and up the sidelines and out of bounds with the first Ohio State first down is Vince Workman, the sophomore. Number 42. Tackle made by Larry Kelm. Now the Ohio State offensive line, Eric. Well, I think Earl Bruce is to be complimented for taking a very young offensive line. Four of them will return. Two of them sophomores, one freshman. The anchor, of course, is Bob Maggs, two-time All-Big Ten center, really a great football player, but the rest of them will be back, and, back, and I think they've done a, an unusually fine job considering their youth. First and ten, Buckeyes. They've got the ball at the 40, trailing 3-0. Nate Harris is the motion man, and Garcetto's hands it off. Vince Workman, number 42. Todd Howard, number 73, makes the tackle for Texas A&M. How about this uh, Aggie defense? Well, the down three really are undersized. And one of the keys today, this Ohio State has a big offensive line. Can these down three hold up? The strength, really, in this defense is the linebackers. Steve Bullitt on one outside, but Johnny Holland, the All-American on the inside, much like Chris Spielman, can chase plays down from behind, has that kind of speed. No gain on the last play, second down and 10, Ohio State. Two-step drop, drill left side, completed. J.D. Holland, nope, incomplete. They James. had a double, excuse me, Vern, they had a double on Carter, and you could see Carsadas immediately went to the left side. You see, he had a one-on-one -on, -one on the, on these. You'll see Carter down here where he's doubled, right here. 
And of course, they immediately try to go to the flanker back. Harsadas throwing away from the, the double coverage. Right there, but apparently he dropped the ball. Well, Nate, Nate Harris, the off receiver from Chris Carter, off and off to catch an awful lot of balls with all the double coverage that Carter gets. Third and ten. Play fake. And Carsados goes deep with time and the win. It's caught. Nate Harris to the seven. You get overly concerned with a great receiver like Chris Carter, and you single coverage Nate Harris, which has tremendous speed. You'll see Carsados lays that ball beautifully as Harris goes to the post and then to the flag right there. Carsados throws a beautiful pass, and Kip Carrington finally gets him down with help from Flowers. I want to tell you what, Arod, nobody could have thrown that ball. That was a frozen roll play. He was well covered, actually, but he let him just enough to get behind the secondary. And as I was saying, if Carter's going to get double teamed, Nate Harris has to be featured. Oh, come on, Pat. You could have thrown one like that. <laughs> I doubt that. I doubt that. Nine minutes to go, first quarter. Workman works left, wiggles through for a couple to the five-yard line. The tackle made by Kip Corrington, and a flag is down on the near side. That was an impressive 51-yard toss from Carsados to Nate Harris. Procedure call now against Ohio State. Now one of the things that Ohio State has done in this opening drive era is move Nate Harris around in motion. And one of the things that is doing is keeping the strong safety from A&M from blitzing. And that's one of the things A&M wanted to do. Here you'll see Harris lined up right here, and he's going to come down and weave in. They're in double coverage, you see, back here. And the open area is the seam right there. Watch the play fake now from Carsados that momentarily throws a short to coverage. He gets behind the cornerback right there, and as Pat pointed out so well, that was a beautiful throw. Double tight end set now for Ohio State, and they will go with a straight T backfield. You've seen this before this year. No button. The old robust is what he used to call it. It's going to power it. They run the option off of this, too. Jim Bryant is number 41. He's joined the backfield. There's the option. And Carsados keeps to the 10-yard to the line. Well, they were working with very little area there. I, they figured that the Aggies would defend the field. And they went to the short side of the field, but the Aggies were up to it and responded well. I'll tell you, for a guy who, who, who seems <laughs> to get a lot of press for negative personal image, Earl Bruce looks a little dapper. Looks like Tom Landry, doesn't he, with that he hat sure there? He sure does. He looks like Ditka now. I mean, with his <laughs> same haberdasher. Ah. He's quieter than Ditka. I want to know how much he paid for that suit. <laughs> Second down and ten. Jim Carsados, fifth-year senior. Two-step drop. Lob pass. Right side. Carter. Intercepted. Jack Brooks playing before a hometown crowd. They tried to underthrow Carter where he's so dangerous, but they didn't count on Chet Brooks being there. Now, one of the problems that Jim Carsados has had this year, he has forced the ball to Chris Carter, and you have a tendency to do that as a quarterback when you have so much confidence in the receiver. Number 30 is a strong safety, just going to lay off to the inside, and Chet Brooks is playing the outside. Now, again, it's underthrown. They expect Carter to use his 6'3 height to go up and get it, but that's a well-defense team. Chet Brooks is there to make the easy interception. So the first turnover of the game goes Texas A&M's way, and they still lead by three. We're back in the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. The first turnover goes the way of Texas A&M, Era. Well, you'll see one-on-one -on -one coverage on Carter. Carsadas tried to take advantage of that. He breaks out, but it is Carsadas' throw that he had a great one when he threw it to Harris, but this time he definitely underthrows the ball. You'll see Carter turns to the outside. He's got a step there on Brooks, but the wall is way underthrown, and you've got to remember that Carter can go straight up in the air with one of the greatest jump reaches I've ever seen. Well, again, when I think you're trying to throw that kind of pass, I think you need to throw that against bump and run coverage, not when a defensive back is four yards off the ball. See that Auburn is leading Southern Cal by seven. Now the Aggies have the ball for the second time in this game. 7.56 to go first quarter. And they lead it by three. Hand off to Roger Vick again. And he's out to the 22-yard line before he runs into Michael Key. Now let's go down to Pat O'Brien. 
All right, Vern, thank you. Standing with Archie Griffin, who has not one but two Heisman trophies. Happy New Year to you. What do you think of the matchup today? Well, I think it's a good matchup. I think we match up pretty evenly. Uh, both offenses will move the football, and unfortunately, uh, our Ohio State Buckeyes uh, didn't get it done put in the end zone just this past series. Notice they're wearing your red shoes today. Yeah, this is not the first time we've worn red shoes at Ohio State. I can remember back when I played, 1972 and 73, we wore red shoes. And you were a great one. Thank you. Let's go back up there. Roger Vick bounces off a tackle. What a terrific effort. And he's got another A&M first down for 31. David Brown and Greg Rogan collaborate for the tackle. You cannot arm tackle Roger Vick. He's just too strong. Now, he comes inside. They shut it down very well. There's a couple of players there that he spins and just bounces outside. You've got to get two or three guys with their arms around him to bring him down. No arm tackling Roger Vick. They're the red shoes. We'll vote. You like them? You don't like them? I like them. Good. I don't like them. Okay, I don't like them. I'm the old coach. <laughs> no, it's one to two. I'll go against the red shoes as well. I think they'd be great on the ballet stage. Here's the pitch out. What side to the 32? Actually, you saw those red shoes in the uh, in the Rose Bowl, I guess, Pat. Well, Archie Griffin, unfortunately, <laughs> used them quite effectively against USC in two Rose Bowls that I played against Archie. Well, it's always a treat for us to be here, and we miss uh, one of our colleagues, Lindsey Nelson, who is back home in Tennessee, watching this game on television for the first time in 26 years. Lindsey, who broadcast 25 straight telecasts for CBS. And Lindsey, we're thinking about you, and we wish you well. What a catch by Bernstein, and it's the first tackle that is missing for Ohio State now. They're not getting that initial hit. You forget how big Bernstein is. He's 230 pounds. He used to be a running back. And so just defending him against the pass is just one problem. After he catches the ball, and it's well defense, the corner, you're going to see Rogan right there, is there to put the play on him, but he can't make the stop. And this is what AM has done all year. They turn five-yard passes into 20-yard gains. Bernstein, a senior from Bryan, only in his second year as a tight end. He caught six in the Scott Bowl a year ago. Pitch out. Woodside. Uh, I wonder who which of us is going to be the first to refer to that combination as Woodward and Bernstein instead of Woodside. <laughs> Washington Post boys, Woodside. yeah. yeah. We'll take another look here at Spielman, how he goes through the, the garbage in a sense. This is what Jackie Sherrill said. He makes people miss and steps in to help. He managed to avoid most of the blockers. He steps around them, behind them. And that's why he's been such a great linebacker. You don't have to take on the blockers, just avoid them. Second down and eight. Texas A&M with a 3-0 lead. Left side, it's Woodside again. Tries a little juke and it doesn't work for much. He gets to the 40 where it'll be third and two and William White number 37 makes the tackle. But Byrne, you see how difficult they're, they are to defend. We've seen Roger Vick up the middle. We've seen some short passes to Burnside. Then we see Vick, when you stop him in the middle, bounce the ball outside for a big play. Third and two, A&M leads, and a player has been helped off the field. Derek Eisenman, number 10, has left the field for Ohio State and was assisted off by trainers. There's Eisenman. Uh, the other thing that impresses me, Vern, is the quickness with which Roger Vick gets started. He starts to hold and still breaks to the outside. That play was designed to run inside, and he just breaks it right to the outside. Third and two. They come to the boundary side, the short side of the field, and it is stopped. Roger Vick and the tackle made by Greg Rogan and Mike McCray. Well, good job of defense. Good support by the Buckeyes. Responded well as fourth down. And Arrow, what AM is trying to do is stretch the defense out here and then run the pitch into the short side of the field. They anticipated a strong side slant to the wide side, but Ohio State switched up and slanted to the boundary, and that's why there was the loss. And instead of, well, they'll shift into the punt formation now. They do that because Craig Stump, the putter, is also the backup quarterback for Texas AM. This may be one of the few ball games you'll see where both backup quarterbacks are the first team putters. There's Stump's kick into the end zone, and that'll be a touchback back to the 20 yard line. The Aggies have moved the ball well, but they have only a field goal to show for it with 4.04 to go first quarter. 
Here's a Cotton Bowl memory for you, 1946. The Longhorns, Bobby Lane from Texas. He ran for three touchdowns that day. He threw for two. He kicked four extra points, and he even caught a touchdown pass. Bobby Lane was responsible for all 40 Texas points in that win over Missouri. He passed away just a few weeks ago at the age of 59, and he is very much missed by all of us, and our thoughts go out to his widow, Carol, in Lubbock, Texas. Texas A&M leading Ohio State 3-0. And now the Buckeyes have the ball for the second time. They will operate out of the out of the eye with Workman and Cooper behind Jim Carsados. Play fake again. Carsados in trouble. That hasn't happened to Ohio State that much this year. They have only been sacked 10 times there, I think, in 295 pass attempts. Well, R.C. Slocum, the defensive coordinator, felt that they could put the pressure on. This is the tailback action, but they bring four men from one side. You see the linebacker wiping off to the right side here. Carsadas cannot squeeze through, and Saddler 99 right there puts him down. Arrow, one of the things I don't like is so much play action fakes because the quarterback never sees the oncoming rush. His back is always to the rush. That's what Ohio State does, too, many, too much play action fakes. Uh, particularly away from that split inside, where there's a short route to get to him. Now they take the uh, tight end out and will go with three wide receivers, but they're going to have to hurry to get the playoff before the 25-second clock. They do. Flood the left side, passes out, almost intercepted. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, mercy. Oh, that's a nice play. James Flowers, who leads this team in interceptions, number 15. What Ohio State is trying to do is much like AM, stretch the field out. You see all the receivers out, force them to play wide defense and then to throw the quick out pass. But you see the rotation up at the top of the screen and pretty good coverage there by Flowers, number 15, as he reads the quarterback, backs off, and then drives on the ball to knock it down. That's good defense. I like that. Aggies bring in a fifth defensive back. Jeff Holly, number two. Garcados wants timeout. That will ignite the yell leaders and the Aggies. 3-10 remaining first quarter. A Scott Slater field goal is the only scoring thus far. Scott Slater's A&M field goal has given the Aggies a 3-0 lead. 3-10 to go first quarter. This is uh, just the beginning of an exciting holiday weekend for you on CBS. Coming up on the NFL today, Saturday, Jim McMahon will be there live. Bobby Bethard will talk about the Redskin injuries as they head into the playoff game. And Terry Bradshaw joins Brent Musburger. That's at 3.30 Eastern time on Saturday from Chicago. Then on Sunday, the NFL today will have Bill Walsh's game plan. Irv and Will, that says in Cross and McDonough, will report from the field. And Brent will be joined by Dick Vermeil with the start time of 12 o'clock Eastern. The NFL today, preceding our playoff games, coming up this weekend on CBS Sports. I'm Vern Lundquist with Eric Parsegian and Pat Hayden here at the Cotton Bowl. And on the sidelines, a baby-faced junior named Tom Tupa. And he's a man that Earl Bruce said they may very well play the second quarter for the Buckeyes. Played real well. You've seen him a lot this year. I was very much impressed. He stepped in when Prasadis got hurt in the Wisconsin game. I'll guarantee you, he is a tremendous football player. Earl Bruce said he might use it. His initial plan is to use him in the second quarter. It's third and 17. Five-man rush. Carsados gets rid of it. That's up for grabs. Oh, oh it's caught. Man. There's Chris Carter with that 38-inch vertical leap. That's exactly what I was talking about. He was covered well. The ball was thrown up. This time he had a chance to go up and take it away. I've seen him do it I don't know how many times. That's why he has 27 career touchdowns. You see right here, Carsadas does a good job of avoiding getting sacked, throws the ball off balance. Now watch Carter as he goes up. Look at his hands above both defenders. Flowers number 15 there and Carrington, both of them shorter than Carter. Johnny Holland, number 11 from the inside, didn't get to Carsados in time. First and 10 from the 46 after converting the third and 17. That last play to Chris Carter. Flags are down. They got Jamie Holland in there now. That's a motion call, a legal procedure against Ohio State. Here's Chris Carter right here as he'll come down and weave right in between these two. 
But the important thing is Karsadis here was able to avoid getting sacked. He's getting a lot of pressure right there. Holland the last one. There it is between the two defenders and watch him go up and get it. But Arrow, what I didn't like though was the play action fake again. It didn't give Karsados really enough time. He had to scramble up into the pocket. How about the results? I like the results. <laughs> I like the results. First and 15, 220 to go. First quarter, 3-0. AM leads. Quick pitch out to the right side. Nate Harris makes the grab. But uh, that's just a gain of a couple. Jimmy Carsados uh, just graduated December 12th from Ohio State. Graduated with a degree in communications, as a matter of fact. Says he's going to take a vacation in Acapulco after this game and then either play pro ball or try and find a job in this goofy business. <laughs> I hope he comes back from Acapulco. I'll tell you what, you can stay down there for a while. Yeah, that's right. Carsados is one of four Ohio State seniors who graduated in the fall, so he's an alumnus. He's got a right to criticize the coach. He got Carter singled here. Second down, Carsados. Screen pass, left side. Nicely set up. George Cooper, the fullback for the AM 46. Vern, you made a good comment there. It was beautifully set up, but the blocking didn't take place. Cooper did do a nice job of running. You can see Cooper number 44 slide out. Carsados flips it off very nicely. It looks like a screen to the right. Then he turns back. Nice blocking out. There's Mags number 71. He does do a job of getting the block. And finally, Cooper is brought down in there by Kell number 65. You know, the Ohio State offense using George Cooper, the fullback, I think is a very good ploy because he's a man that's often overlooked. That's right. They don't give him the ball very often. Now a double tight end set up on third down and two for Ohio State. John Hutchinson, the extra tight end, is in motion. They'll come right, cut back left. Workman, first down at the 39. Nifty little move. Well, he, Era, he did a really nice job of once he got past the line of scrimmage and cut back. That was very good eyes by Workman. I tell you, he's an underrated running back. The last three games that he played in, he had over 100 yards. That includes the University of Michigan with that big 46-yarder. And against Wisconsin, he had 170-some yards. You can see that he's an almost a 1,000-yard getter also. Had problems earlier this year fumbling and was benched for Jim Bryant. He started out the season operating with uh, John Woolridge, alternating, rather. And Woolridge went out with an knee injury against Alabama. Here's Carsados looking deep and firing that way, and he's got a man Ooh. wide open. Jamie Holland, who's got super speed. A senior who hadn't lettered until this year. Holland has run a 10.28, 100 meters. He's right here and he just speeds right down the slot. Got him off the field there. Right, right down the sideline to get him back in the ball game here. But anyway, you'll see the speed as he runs right by the corner. Oh, he's by him right now. He's wide open. Carsado sees it. Boom, he hits him almost under thrown. 38-yard pass, first and goal. And the double tight end set up now for Ohio State. And the first quarter is going to come to a close prior to the snap of the play. Jamie Holland, just a squad man from Wake Forest, North Carolina. That is a 38-yard gain to give the Buckeyes a first and goal. And we'll be right back after this message and a word from your local station. Happy New Year from all of us at CBS. We're in Dallas, Texas for the 51st annual Cotton Bowl Classic. The Aggies lead 3-0, but A&M now in trouble as we look at the last Ohio State play. Pat? Here's what happened. Here is Jamie Holland. He is receiver. Now, these two men are going to cover him inside and outside. But when he takes off, the tight end runs this route up here. The safety gets attracted by him, falls in. That leaves Holland open for the big play. So the key here is the play of the safety. Watch him react. He steps right there for the tight end, and then it clears Holland for the big play right there. 38-yard gain to the one. Ohio State has the ball. First and goal. Trailing by three. Vern Lundquist, Pat Hayden, Eric Parsegian, Pat O'Brien, and Jim Nance will be along at halftime. Temperature in the lower 50s and a very brisk breeze out of the north. And here come the Buckeyes. Double tight end set, and a motion to the left side. Excellent defensive surge led by Kip Corrington, number 10. Boy, what's that? There was a lot of penetration on the right side. Looked like it might develop into a touchdown play, but then it closed down immediately. 
Good defensive response. Watch the line surge right here in the penetration they get. Here's Cooper trying to make a block. He's completely neutralized in there. Cooper is about 246 or 48 and has moved backwards. Second down. Jim Bryant is in the lineup now. Number 41, straight T. Look for the option here. Option play. Carsados. Nice decision by Carsados. Touchdown, Ohio State. That's a nice play. Well, you take a look at Jim Carsados. He's the last guy you'd expect <laughs> to be running the option. Oh, no, he has run the option the last two years. Uh, from open formation, it's not so much from the close formation, but the goal line and short yardage attack, he will go ahead and run it as well. Garcados gets the touchdown, and Matt France is on for the extra point. It's good, and the passing of Jim Garcados puts them in position for the touchdown. He is 6 of 9 now for 143. Look at the option play with Garcados scoring. Watch him draw the linebacker's attention as he pulls, gives the ball to Cooper, appears to, then keeps it. Now he comes down the line, might or might not deal it off. Harrington runs by it, number 10, and of course, Carsada steps inside of it for the score. Terrific drive put together by Ohio State. 80 yards and nine plays. The big play was a pass to Chris Carter on a third and 17, and then the toss to Jamie Holland. Jimmy Carsado's having some fun telling his teammates, boy, I blew through there. But here's the key play, and it was Carsados' right arm. With play action, just a slight fake to Workman, and then he finds speedy Jamie Holland down the left side. That's a 38-yard gain, first and goal at the one after a loss. The touchdown, Carsados on the option. Pat? a and had this well defense. Here is Kip Corrington, and he is the free safety. He's going to get caught up in some traffic, and he has to step around the traffic, but he really should have made the play on Carsados. Watch him. Now he has to step around the traffic there, and then Carsados cuts right back inside, right here, when he overruns it. Good decision by Carsados. And that's what Carsados meant by... <laughs> I right blew <laughs> through there. <laughs> Got the touchdown. Pat O'Morrow will kick off for Ohio State. Rod Harris is the deep man. Flanked by Ira Valentine and Mickey Washington. Harris wearing number 17. He's a sophomore, one of 14 players in the Dallas area for a &M. Into the wind, a short kick. Hmm. Harris at the 21. Comes right, has some room. Out of bounds at the 44, right in front of his teammates. Tackle made by Sonny Gordon. When you're in the kickoff team, you don't realize you're kicking so much against the wind and it's going to be such a short kick. I think some of the Ohio State players ran right by Rod Harris, came up on a very short kick, and then picked up a couple of blocks for the big game and puts their offense with the wind in very good field position. Buckeyes need the 12th man. <laughs> or 13, perhaps. First down, 10 A&M. Aggies trailing 7-3, 14-13 to go, and they spread it out to the left side. Nobody in the backfield. And whistles blow as the pass is delivered. Flag is down. That's intended for Rod Bernstein. Procedure call, Texas a and Well, we are finally to New Year's Day. There have been a lot of bowl games played thus far. Boston College nipped Georgia by three in the Hall of Fame Bowl on the 23rd. It all started with San Jose State's win over Miami of Ohio. Then Mississippi edge Texas Tech. New head coach Spike Dykes of Tech. Alabama soundly routed Washington 28-6. Clemson and Stanford 27-21 in the Gator Bowl last Saturday. Arizona under Larry Smith defeated North Carolina by nine. In the Freedom Bowl, Gaston Green, what a huge day he had. First down and 15 now. And the handoff goes left. That won't go anywhere. Roger Vick. With the tackle. And 
Chris Fieldman again. Chris Fieldman had 29 tackles in the Michigan game era. Unbelievable. He's he's all over the field. Here he is lined up as that inside linebacker spot. He'll wipe off immediately towards Vic. Vic tries to bounce it to the outside. Look at him ward off Woodside as a blocker and step in there on Vic. One of the best jobs they've done thus far against Vic. Boy, era. Spielman's very good at the point of attack. I thought he was more of a chasing type of linebacker, but right there he was very good at the point of attack. All right, he wiped right through Woodside. Second down and 15. Saw the graphic with Spielman and Johnny Hall, two of the better linebackers in the country. They look for Bernstein. Here's the nimble-footed effort of Kevin Murray, and he's able to get only to the 40-yard line as Michael Key, number 30, made the tackle. Murray is playing on an ankle that he broke a couple of years ago, and that right ankle of his is always swollen. It's going to be a problem for him the rest of his life, I think. One of the things that hurt that pattern for Murray was that the linebackers, inside linebackers, knocked off Bernstein. He couldn't get through to the pattern that he wanted. He was looking for Bernstein. Michael Key, the inside linebacker, just turned as soon as he saw the tight end release over the middle and gave him a shot, and Murray had nowhere to go with the ball. Kevin Murray got a medical redshirt year because of that ankle, and, and he is eligible for the NFL draft next year. One of the key questions this week has been whether or not he will come back for his senior season. And Kevin Murray says he'll decide after this game. Looks like they're blitzing. Indeed they are. Murray reads it, fires it on a line to midfield. Whew. Well, I'll tell you, they're gonna, they've are gonna. they been burned every time they go ahead and try to get the... Try to get to Murray, and they can't. As soon as they see it, they get one-on-one -on -one here. He just breaks down to the inside. Murray gets the ball to the receiver before they can get to him. Look at the blitzing going in there. Richard, everybody's going all one-on-one, -on -one, but he gets the ball in there, but they're forced to punt because he didn't quite get the first down. Here's Todd Schantz, a fifth-year senior from Richardson, suburb of Dallas. And that kick takes an Ohio State bounce back to the 12, but Schantz they use on the long-distance kicks. He's averaging better than 47 yards per punt this year. So Ohio State holds. It'll be the Buckeyes with the ball when we return right after this message. You know, it's two good football teams out there, and there's going to be some scoring, and it's going to be some uh, it's going to be some hard licks. The defense is going to play well. The offense is going to do some things that's uh, going to hurt the defense. But I, you know, it, it's going to be a great game. It has been a great game, and. Uh, uh, I think the I think probably the Buckeyes being able to throw the ball as well as they have so far is a little surprising. But other than that, I think everything's going along pretty good. All right, John, thank you. Back upstairs. Okay, Pat. And there's Tom Tupaira. You've seen him a lot this year too. And he's very cool, poised. He can run the option. Has a good arm. First down, ten. Six five, junior from Brexville, Ohio. And that works out to the 15 yard line. I was talking to Chris Carter yesterday about the difference between Carsados and Tupa and when they throw the football. And Carter said Tupa really throws a much harder ball, a lot more velocity. He thinks he's going to have to learn how to throw the touch pass like Carsados does this year. Oh, he, you know, he's a great baseball player. And as a result, you know, they like to hum that ball. <laughs> and, I, and that's one of the things that got to quiet him down, give him the soft touch. Second down and seven. to go in the first half. Ohio State leads 7-3. Option the option. play. And the pitch. Workman. Boy, what a nice job Chet Brooks did, number 27, to come up and close on the play. And there is an injured Ohio State Buckeye at the 15-yard line. Jay Schaefer is the injured player. Chris Carter, really a, a fascinating young man from Middletown, Ohio. Yesterday, we asked him if he could be stopped from his wide receiver position. Yeah, I think so, definitely. How would it be done? Um, I don't know, but if I did, I probably wouldn't say it on TV. <laughs> <laughs> he's also listed at 6'3". <laughs> Got that tie loose. Yeah, the he's he's listed at 6'3", and he told Pat and me the other day he's not quite. And you had an interesting story about height measurements, Mr. Hayden. Oh, you know, I was always yeah, taking grief yeah. about my height, but when the pro oh. scouts came around USC to measure me, what I used to do is take knee pads and actually cut them up and tape them to the bottom of my feet. Lynn Swan and I did this to make myself an inch and a half or two inches taller. So I actually came out six feet for the pros. Wait a minute. <laughs> you take the knee pad and you put it I underneath the foot. And you tape and then you put the socks on because the pro scouts measure you in socks and shorts. And so all of a sudden I went from 5'10 to 6 feet. <laughs> 
So it's true about you. You're really a short quarterback. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> He's really 5'8". <five>, <laughs> oh. Well, there's Dapper Earl Bruce walking on the sideline. One other thing about, about Earl in the week that they've had is uh, Jay Schaefer has helped to his feet. There was a lot of publicity given to a comment that Earl made after the Michigan game about not wanting to be like Jackie Sherrill. And it came up in front of the press this week. And Jackie said, I understand why he said that. And Earl said, hey, I, you know, I, they got me when I was angry. I just lost to Michigan by two. And all I was trying to say is, I've got to be Earl Bruce. I can't be anybody else. And uh, at, a, at a joint press conference the other day, Jackie blew up a balloon into the figure of an animal and presented it to Earl as a peace offering of sorts. I guess that's what he meant it for. <laughs> well, this is a, a tough break now for Ohio State. Their offensive line, they came into the game hurt, and now they lose their second starter, Jay Schaefer. Tim Moxley has taken his place, number 74. Auburn leading 14-7, fourth quarter. Third down and four. Flags are down, and so is the ball carrier. Larry Kelm, number 65, made the tackle on Workman. Burn, it looked to me that the right guard from Ohio State jumped, and this can happen when you substitute quarterbacks. There's a different cadence, a different feel when the second-team quarterback is underneath the center. And I think that ball fell. Call. Greg right. Zakharoff. I think they also sensed that there was going to be a blitz because there, everyone was coming. The corner was coming, the linebacker went, and they, you get a little nervous as the, on the <laughs> offensive side. You see all that action. It's a dead ball penalty. There are no options on the play. It's got to be taken. A five-yard penalty. Third down. <laughs> okay. I've known Jim Garvey for a couple of years. Uh, oh, five or six, I guess. I really think he's terrific because, boy, he takes charge of a football game. Yeah. There's no doubt. <laughs> I saw him at the dance last night. He was taking charge of that. <laughs> <laughs> Third and ten. Here they come again. Blitz. Mm. Ooh. Rod Sadler, number 99. And he came over Moxley, number 74, who had just replaced Jay Schaefer, the injured tackle. A&M &A is much quicker on the defensive front. Ohio State is big, but 99, right there, Sadler, comes right back over the new player, and Tupa never had a chance to even see him. Sadler, who played sensationally in last year's Cotton Bowl game as well. You can see how injuries affect you. Now Ohio State punts for the first time. Tupa has a, uh, an average of 43 yards this year. 43-6, but he is kicking into this breeze at 13 miles an hour. Not good. Out of bounds inside the 30-yard line. Air, I'm curious, when he is playing quarterback, is he as good a punter? Well, uh... I would say on the strength of that kick, no. But, but basically, I think that you can do both. I don't think he certainly was, wasn't exhausted. And he, uh, you do get warmed up in a ball game. So I would think that later in the ball game, if it's hot and you get tired, that type of thing might affect it. But I just think that was one of those balls that just didn't catch because I've seen him kick too many good ones. Texas A&M, 9-2 for the year. The only losses they have had, LSU and Arkansas. And they've got terrific field position now after the short punt. And off to Roger Vick, been the most active of the ball carriers for Texas A&M. Now, once again, let's check in with Pat O'Brien. All right, Vern, down here with Jay Schaefer. They're working on him. He can't even move his right foot. He has a sprained right foot and a sprained knee. It is doubtful he will see any more action in this football game, and that's a big loss. Let's go back upstairs. It is, Pat, because Jay Schaefer took the place of Larry Cotterman, the starter, a couple of weeks back, and now Moxley is in there, and they really are thin at tackle. And we saw what happened when Rod Sadler got the sack on the first play after Moxley came in. Full man rush for Ohio State. Murray almost oh, picked off. Oh, Boy, should have been. Oh. Michael Key had an acre in which to roam if he got the ball. <laughs> Michael Key has really been the defense here today. The difference today. Bernstein, the tight end this time, lines up in the backfield and goes in motion. The linebacker is going to come out and make a very good play. That is Michael Key. He stopped Bernstein earlier in the game on an inside break. This time he plays the outside break and drives hard. Uh, just the kind of matchup that the Aggies want. Bernstein against the linebacker. But as you see, White 37 steps in there and almost gets it. Ohio State is thus far winning that matchup. Yes, they are. They've 
uh, the defense has done a good job. Third and seven, blitz threatened, and they drop everybody. They rush two and send nine back. Murray, a little confused, but look at all the time he has and throws it away. And he had Tony Thompson at the five-yard line. That was an excellent job of camouflaging what might have been a blitz, and then they dropped clear back out of there with nine men, and Murray didn't know what to do. It broke the rhythm of the pattern, exactly what happened. You'll see that everybody, you, they appear to be blitzing here. All these people look like they're going to come. Murray thinks it's man-on-man. -man. Probably called that kind of a route. Now look at everybody drop out. Murray's look, destroyed the timing of the pattern. He did have an open receiver here and overthrew it. Scott Slater from 44 yards away and the wind behind him. And that is perfect. That's his 23rd field goal this year. Sophomore from Fort Worth. A walk-on prior to the season. So the Aggies do manage to get a field goal, but they had hoped for much, much more. They still trail by one. We have a gorgeous day in Dallas today. Sunny skies. Wasn't always this way on New Year's Day. Remember 1979? We'll help you recall it. Notre Dame against Houston. And cold and ice and a wind chill of minus six were the stories on this day. Worst cold front ever to blow through Texas on New Year's Day. The Irish trailed Houston 34-12 in the final period. But Joe Montana capped a miracle comeback with this pass to Chris Haynes. Two seconds left, and the Irish had a 35-34 win. I will remember that one, 1979. And we've been blessed with glorious weather today. And thanks to the Seacles from... Akron, Ohio, and Happy New Year to all of you all. Out of all of you all, huh? <laughs> you Sometimes are from Texas. old are habits are hard to break. <laughs> Boy, my mother, I really appreciate that, Mom. Thank you very much. I think they hey, spent a little money. That's my hometown. Come on, <laughs> fellas. I mean, that's aimed for me. <laughs> well, I've been to Akron once. <laughs> Scott Slater getting ready to kick off. Deep man, Everett Ross, number five. surprisingly they decide to bring it out oh. and here's the 12th man in action again well that'll fire them up even further Rick Tankersley number 20 made the tackle I'll tell you something fascinating about this 12th man the tradition began in this area 65 years ago today Texas A&M was facing Center College and DX Bible was the head coach and a man named Dr. E. King Gill was a basketball player and he stood on the sidelines. It wasn't in the Cotton Bowl. It was in the old Fair Park football stadium. DX Bible had some injuries, asked Dr. Gill to come down and get dressed in case he was needed. He never played, but that's how the 12th man started. And it was 65 years ago today. That's out to the 18, George Cooper. Hey, Vern, how do you know all these Southwest Conference stories? You've been spending a lot of time down here, I know. I, I never heard any of those stories on the Pac-10. i got to tell you, the nice, nice symmetry to that story is that in his retirement, DX Bible and his wife built a home at 4204 Lullwood in Austin, <laughs> right next door to Reverend M.L. Lundquist oh, and his five kids. I'm dead serious. Oh. <laughs> I got the 12th man story firsthand. <laughs> I was about 14 years old. <laughs> Second down and four. 8.45 to go. Oh, quick opener to the left side. George Cooper, number 44. Cooper's a good runner. They, the, the style of attack that uh, the Buckeyes use, of course, is a tailback action and used mostly with Workman and Carsadas. But in this particular case, twice in a row, which is unusual, Cooper gets the ball, and he just good, great blocking at the point of attack there and Cooper is going to be measured for a first down. Yeah, I think when you have the offensive line that Ohio State does and a big fullback 240 pounds you have to give him the ball. Johnny Holland number 11 fights off one block but by that time Cooper had already picked up four yards. Good block there by 68 Ullenheim. And Ullenheim is back in the lineup. He's playing with an injury era. Yeah, I talked to Dr. Olix who is their team physician was a teammate of mine at Miami of Ohio and he said that he would see action today he has a stretched uh, medial collateral ligament. My son will understand that. He's in Tucson, an orthopedic surgeon. I want you to know how much I know about it. <laughs> <laughs> First down, Ohio State. And they go with a straight T once again. And this is not in a short yardage situation. To the fullback. Tupa with a nice uh, handoff. That goes to Cooper. 
And now folks riding was to number 44, George Cooper. 7.59 to go in our ball game in the first half. Coming up at halftime, College Football 86, a magic moment. You'll really enjoy that. A look back at the year. Irv Cross will preview the Chicago Bears, and we'll have all the pageantry of the Cotton Bowl. Jim Nance is here to host the halftime show. And that's 7 minutes and 38 seconds from now. Second down and 8. Tupel with a play fake. Incomplete at the 35. Intended for Ed Taggart, the tight end, number 80. And Alex Morris, number 30, putting a little pressure on. <laughs> Somebody got confused when he put his shoes on this morning. Well, he is he is the punter. And because of the new, you know, this punters are superstitious, as you, we all well know. And the first time they wear the red shoes, he doesn't trust it on his right foot. So he's got his old punting shoe there. Boy, he's not going to make the cover of Gentleman's Quarterly like that. <laughs> But he's easily identifiable for us. He's the guy with... Here they come again. Oh. They fake the blitz. Tupa. Oh, what a pass. Chris Carter. From Middletown, Ohio. Out of bounds at the two-yard line. Chris Carter is in the slot, but the key here is how much room, how much cushion he has. You see how much room he has here? It's an easy outbreak for him. you got to put a little bit more pressure on him. And if you're going to single cover him, you have to blitz. There wasn't a blitz there, and there wasn't really any underneath coverage outside. That left Carter wide open. That's too much for a strong safety Morris to cover. He probably, probably was afraid of Carter going deep on him. I'd rather give him that than the big one because Carter can go. 7-6, Ohio State has the lead with 7.24 to go first half. The pullback, George Cooper, number 44, from Wyandotte, New York. And Steve Bullitt, number 66, makes the tackle for the Aggies. Looks to me like Tupa's trying to set up the option plays, giving the ball twice in the last three plays, and then going to come to the outside. One of the things the option play does, uh, Era, is force the defensive secondary to come up and play run support, too, and I think that has to help uh, Carter get open some. When you get the defensive backfield involved in run support, it's got to help your wide receiver. Well, the whole offense is predicated on that. The tailback action, the belly action, and then set up the passes for him. Second down and six, Ohio State. Jamie Holland in motion. There Here's is. the option. Workman coming left, chased by Maroon and White. And knocked out of bounds at the 47-yard line by Kip Corrington, number 10. You can just smell that coming because this is a sequence football team. They like to set things up. This time, of course, now they fake the ball to Cooper. And Tupa comes down and he, he's predetermined he's going to pitch the ball out. Workman doesn't quite have enough leverage at the corner, and Corrington brings him down just shy, I think, of the first down. But again, you see the free safety had to make the play. Update, oh. Auburn gets a safety on Southern Cal, 16 to seven now in the fourth quarter. Third and less than a foot. Double tight end set. And at least for the moment, the eye formation listened to Tom Cooper. Quarterback keeper. And that shouldn't be enough to move the chain. That's a good call there, too. I like that in short yard. You have Bob Maggs, your center, 292 pounds. You have a 6'5 quarterback, over 200 pounds, and all you need is a yard. You just follow the center. Here's a ground-level look at what happens here. The center right in the middle of your screen. He just charges right ahead, and Tupa has a sense just to follow him. It's an easy play, wedge blocking by the offensive line. You got to pick that up about 95% of the time. Going into the win, this has been a most impressive Ohio State drive. And they have the total offense lead thus far. The blitz is threatened by the Aggies. See if they're coming. They are. Quick step. And if that doesn't uh, get completed, they Ooh. might have gone for a bundle. Chet Brooks Ooh. almost picks it off in front of Nate Harris. Ooh. Boy, then he took a chance, but he knew that with the blitz on that he'd have to get the ball to him quickly. He'll step in there, but watch this. They know the blitz is on. Here comes the corner right there. There's the throw by Tupa very quickly, and he stepped right there. Brooks almost gets to it, but by the same token, it could have gone the other way with Harris, 26, if he had not gone down. Carter and Harris between them, 65 catches plus 24, second down and five. And again, the Aggies threaten the blitz. Pitch out, right side of the short side of the field. Workman, first down, Ohio State. Jeff Brooks makes the tackle. I don't think Texas 
the Aggies expected as much option from this football team. This is kind of a surprise to them. I'm sure they worked on the tailback action and stopping uh, Chris Carter, but now they're running the option play against them, and they probably aren't properly uh, defense for it. Is this something they've not shown that much of this year? That's right, exactly. Well, he ran a little bit earlier in the year, but the last part of the season was the running of Workman on just power plays and the passing of Carsadas to Carter. 7-6 to score, 5-12 remaining first half. Ohio State with the lead and a first down. Jamie Holland in motion, play fake, Tupa looking left toward Holland and fires it toward Jamie Holland, and it's bobbled and picked off. Larry Kell, number 65, on the rebound. His first interception this season. Now, is there any question in your mind that Tupa can't throw the ball? I mean, he got that ball there right now. It may have been too hot to handle. And also, I think perhaps Era the Sun was involved a little bit, too. Jamie Holland, number six, is the man in motion here. He's going to come down and make the play. And there's a big little gap right here in the middle. Right here is where he's stopping. The ball is thrown, and he loses, I think, somewhat the ball in the sun, but the ball easily should have been caught. Kelm trailing makes the interception. That is the second interception. And watch the end of it and the rebound. The alert reaction now from Larry Kelm as Holland has it go up in the air and tips it again. And Larry Kelm fields it like a center fielder. And the Aggies get their second interception of the first half. 4.57 to go. Two Ohio State turnovers thus far. Kevin Murray with the Aggies right on target. Tony Thompson, the sophomore from Houston, is tackled by Michael Key. Be interesting now, fellas, to watch AM on offense because I think we agree that uh, this is one of the few decent uh, performances Kevin Murray's had in this first half. Well, here he finds Tony Thompson. This is a nice adjustment by AM because they tried earlier to try to get the ball to Bernstein an awful lot. Ohio State did a marvelous job of taking the tight end away, so they counterpunch and come back with Tony Thompson, number 80 over the middle. Remember, we said one of the key matchups at the top of the game, number 29, Bernstein on the inside linebackers. Michael Key, number 30 for Ohio State, has won that job. He's done an excellent job, but when you put five guys out, Murray can hit any one of those. He's featured Bernstein, of course, in Woodside, but now they've been defensed well. He's going to go to other receivers. We're live in the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. Ohio State leads Texas A&M 7-6. Vern Lundquist, Air Force Season, Pat Hayden. We've got Pat O'Brien and Jim Nance with us as well. The Yankees have a first down and 10, and Keith Woodside breaks loose to the 42. David Brown hit him first. Chris Spielman came up next. They can give you power football, too. This is the nice thing about AM. We've seen a lot of finesse here. The right guard, Fontenot, 67, gets a real nice block, and Vic clears the way for Woodside, too. But makes him difficult to defend the finesse they run a little pitch play outside and then they come right inside too with some power you're right pat uh Vic did a nice job on key second down about a foot woodside sets up left side up the middle roger Vick to midfield tackle made by the freshman safety david brown number 27. As far as a and strategy is going here, they have three timeouts left with 3.41. What they would like to do, obviously, is control the clock and then get in for the score. We talked about Michael Key, number 30. Here he just gets caught in some traffic. And you see Roger Vick, he breaks tackles. You can't arm tackle him. You need some help. It's his quickness off the ball. He really moves. From up here, he looks faster than any back I've seen. Reveille 5 is enthused by what's going on. The mascot of a and Murray, little soft flip, Woodside, left side, out of bounds. First down, Aggies. You can't, that, that's that mismatch you were talking about. You had, you wound up with Woodside trying to be covered by Key. It's almost impossible. That's what they look for. They look for the, Key will be in here, number 30, trying to chase across here with him coming out of the backfield. And he gets, really gets about two or three steps up on him right now. Watch. He get, oh, he gets caught in the traffic there a little bit. But right now, Key is beat. You see that? Woodside has leverage on him. So the tight end actually picked Key, number 30. The tight end, Bernstein, got in Key's way. He couldn't get out in the flat to cover Woodside. That's the first catch today for Woodside. Good for 16 yards and an AM first down. Here's the option. And a dangerous pitch. And Vick is hit for a loss by the defensive captain, Sonny Gordon, number seven. Boy, he did a good job of coming up to support. 
Oh, there were two great plays there. Vic actually catching the pitch, and then Sonny Gordon coming up and making the stop. Yeah, but he did field the ball well. The ball was yeah. thrown beyond him and up a little bit high. He did a good job Oof. on it. Here he's coming out with a little ankle mm. sprain, maybe. Here's, a, here's the first thing. Watch Vic, because this ball is way out in front of him. He does a nice job of just hanging onto the ball. And Sonny Gordon, who's been terrific on support all year long from the strong safety position. Typically, it was Chris Spielman who put the pressure mm. on the quarterback. And now Ira Valentine is the AM fullback. Four-man rush for Ohio State. Oh, what a pass by Murray. What a gorgeous pass. It's incomplete. But boy, did he have that on the mark to Tony Thompson. He had him open. I'll tell you what, Era, I am very, very impressed with this Ohio State pass defense scheme here today. You see the inside linebackers taking the underneath routes. And number three, Sean Bell just drives on the ball and keeps Tony Thompson from connection. That's good coverage both underneath and downfield. And the very thing that we talked about at the top of the show about the most important thing as far as this game is concerned was the ability of the Buckeyes to try to contain this great offensive team. Thus far, they've done a good job. A lot of time in the game, though. Third and 12, A&M. They trail 7-6. Murray. Thompson's there. Pass over Tony. He was there, but only by a foot or so. Tony Thompson, the intended receiver. Watch Bernstein come out of here as a tight end and come right down to the post and see how open he is. Murray misses him. He releases right off the line. There he goes, right there. Look at him mm. right in the seam. Mm -mm. But I think the defender may have been responding to Murray's pass and moving to the ball. 53-yard attempt now for Scott Slater. He's 2 of 2 today. Has the wind behind him. That's got plenty of distance. And it's no good to the right. So Scott Slater is 2 out of 3 and an opportunity for the Aggies to go back on top at least momentarily goes by the wayside. Two minutes and 15 seconds to go first half. Excellent Ohio State defensive effort so far. Pat O'Brien on the Texas A&M side. That's Roger Victor. They're working on his right ankle. He has sprained his right ankle, but uh, the timing is okay because they're going to look at it through the halftime. They think he will be in for the second half, and that's an important one. Let's go back upstairs. It is indeed, Pat, and thanks. And in the meantime, Texas A&M decided to try that 53-yard field goal in not making it era. They've given up a lot of field position as uh, Ohio State takes over at the 36. Exactly. From a coaching standpoint, you just don't like to take that kind of a risk. Yet the field goal was worth going for. You had the win. But now you take a Buckeye team that's passing the ball well. They don't have to move very far to have an opportunity to put points on the board. And the Buckeyes go with three wide receivers on first down. Carter to the left, the other two are wide right, and a trip set that they haven't used that much this year. This is a new formation. Pass right side is caught. Everett Ross, number five, makes the catch. Plenty of time here for Ohio State. They have two timeouts remaining, 208, and this is the kind of situation where AM will probably give them a little bit more zone defense and those receivers, and they've got some quick ones on the outside can find some open spots. What I've been impressed with there, Ohio State, is they've been passing the ball around, they, and particularly the second quarter, they haven't just been strictly going to Chris Carter. Right, they're a well-balanced team. They've run and passed equally during the course of the year. Second and five, 2.08 to go in the first half. Tupa, mm. batted back in his face. <laughs> Rod Sadler, number 99. Senior from Atlanta, not had that good a year. Now, if Doug Flutie is watching, <laughs> even a tall quarterback, Doug, gets the passes knocked down. He, he and I were both upset about that. Announcers always say when the short guys get the passes uh -oh. tipped, but never the tall guys. Yeah, but what's the numbers on those? I mean, is it like 30% or is it 90%? <laughs> you say that with a certain amount of emotion I haven't seen before this year. So will Flutie. Third and five. And again, the trip set to the left side. Reverse, Jamie Holland, oh, who's got it, wide open. And he cut back when he might have gone to the outside and gotten the block on Chet Brooks. Vern, that's a good, good point, I'll tell you, because it looked like he had beautiful blocking. It was well set up. He just couldn't seem to make up his mind which way he wanted to go. And he's got all kinds. You'll see Tupa come out here like he's going to roll out to the left, and then Holland will come back and bring it back to the outside. Now, watch the blocking set up. 
You can see it now from this angle, right there. Now look at the blocking set out there. If he stays down the sideline, mm -hmm. he would have done much better. Okay, to give Chet Brooks some credit there too, Era. Chet Brooks did a nice job of fighting off a couple of linemen to make the play. Yeah, they defended it well. Ohio State has called timeout. They've got the ball in a lead of 76 with 153 to go in the first half. In the meantime, let's visit Texas A&M University. And it's really good to have members of the Ohio State University faculty and staff and the athletic department here with us in Dallas. We're in the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas, the 51st annual with the Buckeyes leading Texas A&M 7-6, 153 to go first half. Ohio State has just used a timeout. They have one left, and the Aggies have all three remaining. This is only the second Ohio State University football visit to Texas in 97 years. They played here on this same field against SMU in 1977 and won that game 35-7. But other than that, they have not been in this state. First down and 10 now, and two for the blitz is coming. Pass left. Oh, oh, oh. oh Johnny Holland had visions of touchdowns dancing through his head. And this is what I was talking about, Era. The play-action fake in a two-minute drill just does not make much sense to me, particularly when you're facing a blitz. Your quarterback turns his back to the coverage. Watch, there's a blitz coming. It's going to be a strong safety blitz from the outside. But he turns his back to the coverage in the play-action fake. It just takes a little bit longer to get rid of the ball. That's a very good point by the same token. Right out here to your right, Chris Carter was wide open one-on-one. -on -one. But a three-step drop, and he delivers it. You get him the ball. Yes, absolutely. Tom Cooper now three out of seven, second and ten. Buckeyes lead. They fake the draw play. Tupa goes deep, double coverage down the right side, and that'll be out of bounds. James Flowers was trying to climb up an imaginary ladder on that sideline to get the ball inbounds, but couldn't do it. I think Tupa misread the coverage that time. He threw to the, to the covered receiver that time. And you're getting a lot of pressure on Tupa. And this is because the history of the Aggies has been rush that passer. He steps inside. He mm. sees he has. Go oh, he gets a good shot there from Kelm, number 65. That's what that's what happens to quarterbacks, huh? That is that what's wrong with that? I think I got so short. <laughs> <laughs> Pat was really 6-3 in the ninth grade. <laughs> Ohio State is six of seven on third down conversions. Reverse or the option rather. Workman. Johnny Holland chases him, and then he takes a belt from Jeff Holly right at the boundary strike. A surprising call to me on third and ten to go with the option play. The option sometimes can come up with, with a big play, obviously, but on third and ten, it's clearly a passing down. You've got a Chris Carter and Jamie Holland with three wide receivers. And good support again, once again, by the strong safety, Alex Morris. I'll tell you, the a and secondary really has done a nice job. Now Tupa lines up under center, and he wants to see what uh, A&M has in mind, and now timeout has been called by the Aggies. I'll tell you, that's terrific strategy there by Ohio State. They put Tupa underneath the center. A&M's confused, so they have to waste one of their timeouts. Now they only have two left with 135. Now they said they were going to do that with Tupa. Going back to that other pl uh, the, the play, the option play, Anytime you catch man-to-man -man coverage where the people are being driven off, the option play is a good play, but there was good recovery by the secondary that time. Now, I agree with you. Probably the down and distance might have dictated a, probably a pass, but it is a good play to run against man-to-man -man coverage and a blitz. <clears throat> 1.35 to go. Jackie Sherlon. I think he's a little surprised with what's happened uh, defensively against his team today. I think that's true because they have moved the ball against virtually everyone they've played against. This is an Aggie team that averaged, as we said at the top of the program, 440 yards per game. They have 155 so far. They are going to get the ball back one more time before halftime. Tupa will punt deep to Rod Harris, number 17, sophomore from Dallas. That is nice. Now, where will they oh. mark it? Yeah. At the nine. nine. That's yeah. more than nice. Yeah. yeah. That is superb. That makes up for that 27 or 23 yarder he <laughs> That's had. That's right. Well, coming up at halftime, Jim Nance will be here as your host. And he'll have a look back at mm. college football 86, the magic moments. 
Irv Cross will look at the injuries that have plagued the Redskins as they head into the playoffs this weekend and we'll have some of the pageantry of the Cotton Bowl. The Ohio State Band is here, the A&M Marching Band. Well, there were some magical moments in college football in 1986, weren't there? Yes, sir. You saw a lot of them. Now the Aggies with 1.27 to go, trail 7-6. And Kevin Murray, who's been a little inconsistent in the first half, will pitch it out on first down. Mm. Keith Woodside runs into Mike McCray, number 99, who was in there in place of Derek Eisenman. Well, Kevin Murray has been a very good quarterback in two-minute drills and a bringing a team from behind. Here you're just going to see number 33, Woodside, on the pitch, just a power play. But A&M's been a good team coming from behind in two-minute drills. They beat Baylor with a touchdown pass with three seconds left. They came from behind and scored against SMU late in the ball game as well. They are not a team that worries about a deficit. 51 seconds to go, the handoff up the middle. Keith Woodside runs into Spielman and Michael Key, the two inside linebackers. If I was Ohio State, I'd take a timeout immediately here. It's third down and long, get the ball back, but they're going to run the clock down. Ohio State should call timeout. Yeah. They've got one left. Force them to punt. Mm. Now they'll be able to run the clock down. Now it's 26 yep. seconds. I think that's a mistake. You force a punt, try to block it, or maybe set up a return. Absolutely. The field position is yours. Well, in retrospect, would you both agree that the key to this first half has been the Ohio State defensive unit? I don't think there's any question about it. It was the question is that we came into the ball game, and the first half has definitely been a success for Ohio State. Ira Valentine gets the last carry of the first half of the 51st annual Cotton Bowl Classic, and Chris Spielman makes the tackle. Well, I said last half. Now they're is a player down for A&M. That's the center, Matt Wilson, a senior who is going to face off-season knee surgery. And Wilson will be mm. helped off the field. They can ill afford to lose him. He's been a, a stalwart in that offensive line. Mm. In the first quarter, the A&M touchdown drive, here is the big play era. This was a big one. Carsadas threw a beautiful pass to Harris. It's off their favorite run action pass. And you see him step inside and there is the ball beautifully thrown to Harris, number 26. Setting up this touchdown in the option play, faking the ball to Cooper, coming on down the line. Carsadas making the decision to step inside as Corrington 10 overruns the play. And now with four seconds remaining in the first half, Todd Schantz is on. There's mm. a little pressure on Schantz, and he wow. sails one. All the way back to the 26-yard line. <laughs> well, that's why they call him the long-range butter. <laughs> Jim Nance coming up in just a moment. We'll be right back after this message and a word from your local stations. Welcome back to the Cotton Bowl, where at halftime it's Ohio State over Texas A&M. The only touchdown, a carry by Jim Carsados from three yards out for the touchdown. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm Jim Nance, and coming up here at the half, we'll be showing you some of the pageantry from the field. Irv Cross will have a report on the playoff game this Saturday between the Bears and the Redskins, and we'll be taking a special musical look back at the emotions and memories of college football 1986. But first, let's go to the scoreboard. There is uh, more action, of course, today on this New Year's Day. Auburn leading with about a minute to go in the Florida Citrus Bowl, 16-7 to over USC. Brent Fullwood has been the big story so far for the Tigers. He's over 150. 50 yards. Of course, this is Ted Tolner's final game as the head coach at USC, and that job is still open out there for the Trojans. Now there's another job open in college football. Alabama is searching for a new leader after Ray Perkins left the Crimson Tide yesterday to take over at Tampa Bay. Now Perkins was asked about leaving his alma mater. Through your life, you have certain, certain opportunities, and you have to make a decision based on the pluses and minuses <clears throat> that are best for you and your family and and I have no question but what this is the best for my myself and my family at this point in time and my family basically is my wife Carolyn because our two kids are, are grown now and gone but uh, that and the combination of a great challenge there and as far as a replacement for Ray Perkins, it uh, appears that Alabama wants to keep it in the family. 
Now, as Pat O'Brien reported before the game, Jackie Sherrill was contacted by Alabama officials this morning. He told them he was not interested in, the, in taking the Alabama job. However, knowing the nature of the coaching business, you must still consider Sherrill a candidate for that post at Alabama until that job is filled. Now, another name that is being prominently mentioned is Howard Schnellenberger. He threw his own hat into the ring yesterday, said he was interested in the job. Alabama has come back and said they are interested in Schnellenberger. Of course, he won a national championship at Miami. He's the current Louisville coach. His connection with Alabama, he played for Bear Bryant at Kentucky, and he coached on the Bears staff at Alabama. A few other names that have been mentioned as candidates, Bobby Bowden, the highly successful coach at Florida State. He's a Birmingham Alabama native, and Danny Ford, who played for the Bear at Alabama, and who also has a national championship on his resume at Clemson. You know, it's amazing to think here we are on the first day of the new year, and two of the most prestigious coaching jobs in college football are open, USC and Alabama. Right now, let's change gears and take a look at one of the most prestigious bands in all of college football. It's the Ohio State Marching Band, some 230 members strong. They call themselves to middle, the best damn band in the land. Play of uncommon distinction and charm. We conclude our salute to Broadway with a song that has become an inspirational part of our daily lives. Rogers and Hammerstein's Climb Every Mountain. at the Cotton Bowl, and Ohio State leads at 7-6 over Texas A&M. Still to come here at the half, we'll be saluting the season pass with some magic moments, and we'll enjoy the music and precision of the Texas A&M marching band. And we'll check in with Irv Cross on the injury-plagued Washington Redskins. We'll be right back. A sold-out Cotton Bowl for the 51st edition of this New Year's Day Classic and now to the delight of some 60,000 Texas A&M fans on hand, the Fighting Texas Aggie Band and the Aggie Warham. the Fighting Texas Aggie Band.
we have our first final in on this New Year's Day from the Florida Citrus Bowl. It's a final. Auburn over USC 16 to 7. Again, Brent Bullwood, the big story. He scored a touchdown, ran for 152 yards. The Tigers end their season at 10 and 2, and USC drops to 7 and 5. It's a big weekend coming up for the NFL playoffs. On Saturday, the defending champion Chicago Bears will battle the banged up Washington Redskins. And for a report on that game, let's join Earth Cross. This week, the Redskins are not only trying to fine-tune their game plan, they're really trying to patch up a battered and bruised team, particularly on offense. After 17 weeks, you get a lot of guys banged up, but uh, Jacob's going to be playing with a cast on his hand. Uh, my ribs feel pretty good. I practiced yesterday. Uh, we expect Gary to be ready. Uh, I think everybody's going to be ready to go. It's, it's like a do-or-die situation. The offensive lineman, you know, we depend so much on our hands, on uh, pass roll and everything. So, uh, you know, maybe it's going to hinder me, maybe not. It's uh, something I'm going to have to work out, and hopefully I can work, work it out by Saturday, and it won't hinder me as much as I think it will. Sometimes you can go in and play an extremely hard physical game and come out of the game clean. Unfortunately, uh, this past week we didn't. Uh, this is normal for the course. So you have good weeks and bad weeks. Unfortunately, last week it was kind of bad. And now it appears things aren't getting any better for Washington because several players reported the risk in park this week fighting the flu. For CBS Sports, I'm Irv Cross. And again, it all gets underway Saturday at 3.30 Eastern Time, Washington and Chicago, 3.30 Eastern Time for the NFL today. It's 7-6 to six here at the Cotton Bowl, Ohio State in front of Texas A&M. And when we come back, we'll take a look at the unforgettable faces and moments in college football this season. We're kicking off the new year here at the Cotton Bowl, and at the moment it's Ohio State by a point over Texas A&M. You know, college football 1986 will be remembered for many reasons. The climb to glory for Vinny Testaverde and his family, as well as his hurricane team. Lou Holtz taking over at Notre Dame, going five and six, but putting the fight back into the Irish. At Oklahoma, the outrageous and outspoken Brian Bosworth, both on the field and off. But above all else, what really makes college football so special is the intensity and emotion. Right now, let's recapture some of the moments that typify college football 1986. If I knew back then all the things I know
Just some of the memories that will last from the college football season 1986. Well, we're making new memories here as we kick off 1987. We're at the Cotton Bowl. It's halftime, and Ohio State's in front of Texas A&M, 7-6. Coming up, we'll rejoin Vern, Era, and Pat for the second half in just a moment. CBS Sports presents the 51st annual Cotton Bowl Classic. Today's game is sponsored by Cotton Incorporated. Cotton, so comfortable and so easy to care for. The U.S. Armed Forces, it's a great place to start. The heartbeat of America, today's Chevrolet. And by GMAC, the financial services people from General Motors. at halftime of the 51st Cotton Bowl Classic in Dallas, Texas. An 80-yard drive and a three-yard touchdown run has given the Ohio State Buckeyes a 7-6 lead. Two Scott Slater field goals accounting for all of the Aggie points. Vern Lundquist, Eric Parsege, and Pat Hayden, we thought early on that uh, the, the Ohio State defense might be the key, and I think thus far that's proven out. Yes, they must continue, continue to do the same thing that they did in the first half. The secondary particularly has done a great job, the linebackers. But offensively, they have 215 yards, which is very impressive against this Texas Aggie team, but only 49 yards of those rushing. I think they have to establish the rushing game in the second half. Pat, it struck me that Kevin Murray is not having a terrific uh, football game thus far. He is off rhythm, and it's because the Ohio State secondary has disrupted his rhythm. We said coming into the game, the key was the tight end Bernstein and Woodside, the halfback. Between them, they've only caught four balls. Now, if a defense is taking away your primary receivers, I think A&M has to go to their wideouts a little bit more with the pass. And will Roger Vick come back in the second half, the big fullback? Here come the Aggies. They won here a year ago against Auburn. They are trying to become only the second team in Southwest Conference history to win back-to-back -back Cotton Bowls. And we'll see if they can accomplish that. But in the meantime, let's pause for this. Seven-six Buckeyes at the half. Roger Vick injured just prior to the half. Let's get an update from Pat O'Brien. All right, Vern, when we last saw Roger Vick, he was on the sidelines nursing a right sprained ankle. I just spoke to Jackie Sherrill. He said Roger Vick should play in the second half. Let's go back upstairs. There is Roger Vick. Boy, that makes a big difference uh, because Vick is such an important part of their inside running game. Again, he's 220 pounds. They need him. Again, we have a close ball game here, and A&M just can't get impatient. A&M will return the opening kickoff in the second half. Pat O'Moro getting ready to kick off for Ohio State. Mickey Washington, Rod Harris, and Ira Valentine of the Deep Men. 7-6, there is Rod Harris out of Dallas Carter High School. Starting wide receiver, though, uh, did not start today because he's got a, a fracture, one of the small bones in his hand. I find that kind of funny. They don't start him at receiver, yet he's back on kickoffs with a fractured hand. That is kind of strange. 50 degrees in Dallas, Texas on the first day of 1987. And the Ohio State Buckeyes with a halftime lead. This is the 15th consecutive year in which Ohio State has found itself playing in a bowl game. At the five, it's Harris. Gets it back as far as the 18-yard line. Tackle made by Brian Benio. Take a look at the comparisons for the running backs. The key man for each team, Vince Workman with 31 yards so far, Vic with 52. Wide receivers Chris Carter, 3 for 55. Bernstein has been held to 3 for 52. They've not been as much of a factor either man in the game as we thought they might. Ohio State has played well when leading, but keep in mind that AM doesn't mind being behind. John Elam, number 57, is the center to start the second half. Wilson's out with an injury. And Vic is in the starting lineup, but might not want to be for very long. Roger Vic carries to the... Dan Lee made the tackle. He starts the second half and gets a big hit by number 30, Michael Key, on the inside. Again, one of the things that A&M felt they could do was pitch the ball back to Vic and let him pick a hole inside. There's absolutely nothing there to go. Daryl Lee, number 95, did a great job of getting some penetration until he got some help from the inside linebackers. Second down and eight. Seven six, Ohio State leads. Bernstein in motion, Wes is coming. May have come before the snap. Or they may have been drawn off. You know, I think Ohio State is going to try to regain the momentum that they had with nine straight wins, and then they lost 
by two points to the Michigan Wolverines. Now they've played an excellent first half, but the third quarter of the Ohio State-Michigan game was the one that really took a toll on this football team. Matter of fact, Earl Bruce told us, uh, Aaron Path, that the, the one factor about his team that he, he'd really been concerned about, here's Jim Garvey. The offensive player reacted to the defense in the neutral zone. There is no foul. <laughs> I knew he'd have the answer. <laughs> Earl Bruce told us earlier this week that his one concern was the letdown of his defensive unit in the second half. That's exactly right, and that's what happened. So this is a very important quarter for the Buckeyes. And Jackie Sherrill, now in his fifth year as Texas A&M's head coach and athletic director. Second down and eight. And John Elam, number 57, has replaced Matt Wilson. That'll be a key offensive line spot for the Aggies. Well, wow. Motion call against a &M. Coming up at the conclusion of today's CBS Sports College football broadcast, Era Pat and I will be participating in a 16-year tradition, selecting a Chevrolet Most Valuable Player of the Game from each of the teams. Chevrolet donates a $1,000 scholarship to the General Scholarship Fund of each school. Pat, didn't you think there were some open receivers for the Aggies in that first uh, half? And that Murray overthrew or underthrew? Because there's some pressure on it. Ohio State, it's a very good job of pressuring him. Second and eight. And it'll be third and eight. He's off to a s slow start in this half. Again, but the adjustment here, you see, they tried to go to the outside receiver just like I talked about. Shea Walker, number 85. That's the first ball that has been thrown his way. And if they're taking away your tight end, your halfback, that's what you have to do. But now AM faces, here it is, the throw to the outside to Walker. But he was still well covered by Rogan, number 29. AM, though, era, finds itself in third and 13. That's the, not the kind of team they are. They, they were in third and four an awful lot this year. This Buckeye defense has held opponents to only 32% of third down conversions. And here's Murray with a little bit of pressure mm. intercepted. Picked off by Chris Spielman. And he might get in. Touchdown. Touchdown, Ohio State, Spielman, with his fifth interception this season. Which is remarkable for a linebacker. It's incredible. Matt France to extend this Buckeye lead. Fourteen to six. the All-American linebacker, number 36, dropping back into his zone. This is his fifth interception as Byrne has talked about. Look at him steal the ball. And there he goes. Not only can he intercept the ball, but he can run with it. He looks like a running back right there. He's got 4'6 speed at about 235. He's a 20-year-old junior out of Maslin, Ohio. As a junior, a finalist for the Butkus and Lombardi Awards, you think he won't be a heavy favorite next year? This is called Let's Impress the Voters on the first day of 1987. A 24-yard touchdown return with the intercepted pass. Chris Fieldman in the end zone. Ohio State leads it 14-6 in the Cotton Bowl Classic. rather sizable Ohio State contingent thrilled with what they just saw. You'd like to look at it again, and we'll let you. Here's Chris Spielman, Pat. Great players have great instincts. Chris Spielman has those. Watch as he looks to his right first. He looked to his right to get a feel. There's nobody there. Here's the look to the right. Then you're going to see him come back left. Nobody there. Then he reads the quarterback, steps right in front of the receiver. That is a sensational play by Spielman as he reads, looks right, looks left, follows the eyes of the quarterback, and gets himself into the end zone. Boy, I like to see that. He says he's <laughs> so does so does Earl Bruce. <laughs> I like Spielman's ambition in life. He's, he's got a moderate goal. He wants to be the best linebacker that ever played. <laughs> <laughs> he's on a start for it. Well, that's right. Rod Harris getting ready to return the kick for the fourth time, and Pat O'Moro getting ready to uh, kick off. That will 
go left. And out of bounds. Touchback. It'll come out to the 20. AM needs to just pick up, a, I think, era, a few first downs. They just don't have any sense of rhythm out there. They're not getting much on first down, you know, and they're finding themselves in third and eight and third and nine. As you pointed it out, Murray is not having a great day. Even with the out pattern, he threw the ball into the ground. He needs to get his confidence back. Certainly that Spielman interception's got to shake it a little bit. I would think they'd try to establish Vic here, just as you pointed out. See what they do on first down from the 20, trailing by eight. Tony Thompson starts in motion to hand off to Woodside, number 33, Keith Woodside, junior from Vidalia, Louisiana, and he runs into the ever-present figure of Chris Spielman. We go back to the basics, as Daryl Raw used to say, we're going to dance with who brung us, and you still got to go back to the wide-open possession passes that they've had a lot of success with. I don't know whether they had an opportunity to make the kind of adjustments that are necessary, because they may be seeing some looks here against the Buckeyes that they didn't anticipate. Saw the LSU lead over Nebraska early. Second down and seven. Mm, boy. Woodside weaves through some traffic and gets out to the 31 for a first down. It's Roger Vick, not Woodside, number 43. Was that, was that Lee that jumped in there on Murray and forced, almost forced a bad pitch? He certainly did. Darryl Lee, number 95, quick penetration on the inside. It was all over Murray's back. Watch number, number 95 jumps in right, right now. Murray pitches the ball low. A, a, good, a good catch there by Vic to keep the ball again and really just picks up uh, oh, the first down there. He just jumped right inside of Trace McGuire, number 61, and he was in right in Murray's lap. First down, 10, A&M. Split backs, two wide receivers to the right, and Murray with a straight drop back. That's on target to the 34-yard line. Well, it, it really wasn't on tar target okay. because if he catches that ball, he should be able to turn back upfield. It, it was a ball thrown too low and a little bit to the outside. Looks like he's rushing it a little bit. I'm talking about Murray's. He goes to throw. He sees a receiver, and he's so anxious to get the ball there. Seems as if he's rushing it, and his timing is off a little bit. He's now 6 out of 15, but only for 82 yards in that critical pass interception just a moment ago. Second down and 6. They come to the left side. Roger Vick breaks two tackles. Across midfield to the 47-yard line. His ankle's fine now. <laughs> sure is. 20-yard gain. The, the philosophy, watch the formation, first of all. It stretches the defense. There's three wide receivers, a little soft spot on the inside. He gets a nice block by Woodside. And Vic, it's a, it's a block on key number 30, then breaks the tackle and takes the ball right upfield. You love to see a guy not try to outrun people, but take the ball right toward the goal line. Darrell Lee, number 95, had him in the backfield again. Could have tackled him for a, a one-yard loss. Murray will throw on first down. Across the middle, Bernstein to the 40-yard line. No, oh, is it intercepted? Yes! Sonny Gordon, number seven. And his se seventh interception. Well, Era, if there are three guys around a tight end, like there were three white jerseys around Bernstein, you've got to find somebody else. Exactly. He forced that ball in there. But you know, this secondary, that came, this Ohio State secondary was underrated as they came into this ball game. Three white jerseys there are around Bernstein. That means somebody on the outside, one of the wide receivers, has to be open. Again, some inside uh, work there. Actually, Murray had pretty good protection, but Gordon did an excellent job of catching that ball. I don't know how he got that ball. Jim Carsados back in at quarterback to start the second half with the option play to get to the fullback. That's George Cooper, number 44, and he gets out to the 43. Watch once again from the end zone, coach, as, as Sonny Gordon gets this interception. I think he steals it from Bernstein. I think Bernstein had it in his hands right here. Slides through as they come down and watch Gordon reach in there with his right arm and bring it right into his right. That ball's on the ground. I don't yeah, that think should, that yeah. that's it. That was not an interception. Incomplete that's a, pass. That, that's a great viewpoint. Our cameramen and people at truck did a great job. Carsados, flag is down. You realize, of course, if they had instant replay in college ball, we'd be here for the next 16 minutes deciding whether or not that was a legal catch. Well, in all, uh, let's get this call. 
an motion all, call against Ohio State. And I'll do respect to uh, the officials because that was a very tough call. We couldn't see it from here, and they camouflaged one another, and it looked as if he did intercept the ball, but it is lying on the ground in his cradle of his arm. Ball start for the offense, and that'll cost Ohio State five yards. Jim Carsados, the senior, is back in as the quarterback for Ohio State. As we said early in the ball game, it was Earl Bruce's intention all along to play the junior Tom Cooper in the second quarter. There was nothing wrong with Carsados in that second quarter. Indeed, he had played very well early. And here he goes deep and plays well in the third period. Uh, Dave Harris, number 26. Carsados stood in that pocket. You'd love to have that kind of time, wouldn't you have, Pat? And well, then great touch as he threw it. Well, Era, you made the point about Kevin Murray a moment ago seeming rushed. Carsados was a man who just was so relaxed there in the pocket. You see right here the motion man comes right down and breaks, but the key thing is the Carter guy. I'm, so, I'm sorry, the Carsados poise as he throws the ball and waits for it. Look at the protection here. Great, now he drops it right in there perfectly. First down from the 31, a 14-6 Ohio State lead. Jim Bryant, number 41, the freshman from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Jim Bryant, number 41. He's in the lineup in place of Workman. Bryant with 653 yards this year. As unsettled as AM's offense is, the defense has to come up with their own big play here. AM's defense has to prevent Ohio State from getting a touchdown here, at least keep, keep them to a field goal, because their offense is just still having their problems. It'll be a second down and eight. 9.35 to go, third quarter. Buckeyes lead 14 to six. Blitz is coming. Marsados in the face of the blitz, fires incomplete in the end zone. Alex Morris was right in his jaw. And that's one way to come up with a big play defensively. Strong safety, Alex Morris, who is now there. He is the man injured right there. Came from way outside. And this was one of AM's game plans. Again, Carsados turns his back to the rush, takes a little bit longer to throw it than if he just dropped back. And Morris is there to put the heat on. The receiver was open. Everett Ross was open because there was no free safety in the middle. Oh, That's a Alex. business about feast or famine when you blitz. You either got to get to him and destroy the timing of the throw, otherwise you're going to get burned for a big play. And it could have very well been if Carsados had been on target. Earl Bruce prowling the sideline. Obviously pleased with his team's first visit to the Cotton Bowl. They lead 14-6. They do have a third and eight now from the 29. Let's look again. See if they gamble. They're coming. Quick screen. Nate Harris gets a terrific block. Oh, what a dandy block he got on the wing. From the tailback, Vince Workman, number 42. That play was set up beautifully, Era. Timing was perfect. It really was. Third and eight is a terrific call against a team that has just blitzed, blitzed you. What do you do? You don't get the sack, so you throw the quick pass. Right here to Harris, but watch the block by 42. Workman, who comes out of the backfield, blocks the defensive back, and that allowed him to pick up the first down. That's a sensational play. Great block on Jeff Holly, who was the defender when Workman came out, and the timing, as you pointed out, was just absolutely perfect. First down, 10, Ohio State. Carsados has been terrific in the one quarter plus uh, five minutes in which he's played. Eight out of 12 now. Slip to the fullback, Cooper, who drives to the 10-yard line. Larry Kelm and Johnny Holland make the tackle. Earl Bruce just called 84 X some pattern X normally is your split end receiver generally Chris Carter you also note that this is the first time that we have seen Earl Bruce without headsets and communication so he must be having has someone there giving passing on the information now his wife gave him that new hat for Christmas up up motion I think Carsados came up it was a call to Chris Carter he saw two defenders to Carter's side and tried to get out of the play. Dead ball foul against the Buckeyes. Ohio State now penalized six times for 29 yards. I tell you, as well as Ohio State's defense is playing, Vern, I think they must make sure that he doesn't get sacked, Carsados that is, or turn the ball over. 
get at least three here. He is second down and 12 after the penalty. Jamie Holland is in the lineup to the right side. They've worked with him on reverses a lot this week. He's in motion now. And goes way to the left side. And Carsados looks short, caught. Chris Carter, number two, makes the grab. Carsados is having a great afternoon. I mean, he, he sits in the pocket well. He's getting a lot of pressure again. You see right in the slot here, Carter just driving off and then breaking to the outside away from number 27, who is Brooks, Chet Brooks. And there's the throw by Carsadas right on the mark. And that's been the difference between Murray and Carsadas. Errol, what I liked what Ohio State did, though, was by sending in motion, they have forced single coverage on Chris Carter. See what they have in mind on third and seven. Blitz look from the Aggies. Motion call, Harris. Option play, pitch to the boundary side of the field. Touchdown, Ohio State. Watch a lead block by Jeff Davidson, number 50, who is starting in place of Hewlett Hague this afternoon and got Workman into the touchdown. That is a great drive, Aaron. They overcame a couple of penalties in there also. And they mixed it up so well. Run and pass, option. Matt France on to try the extra point. This is a beautifully conceived play on the part of the Buckeyes. Great call. You'll see the motion that will come right here all the way across the backfield. Now watch all of the secondary people all move out of position. Then they'll come back with the option play, fake to the fullback, and pitch the ball out. Look at them all move. There's a single coverage over here. Now there's the fake to the fullback to hold the inside. There's the deal off the... Now look at here, the blocking combinations out here to set it for the ball carrier. There it is, he steps inside, they wall off. That was a nice job. That was a nice drive. It's been a nice game played thus far by the Ohio State Buckeyes. <laughs> Sellout crowd gathered in the sunshine in Dallas, Texas on the first day of 1987. And that was a well-conceived scoring drive of 59 yards in eight plays. Vince Workman got the touchdown from eight yards out, and now Ohio State has a 15-point lead as they go for their first 10 victory season under Earl Bruce. They've won nine and three. So they've been nine and three so often it's almost chiseled on his forehead. Seven years in a row. Yeah. That will be a touchback. And Earl Bruce... Looking dapper in the sunshine. Pat Hayden, you've been impressed with his uh, play calling so far. I don't think Earl Bruce gets enough credit. Everybody says he doesn't have charisma. Charisma doesn't win football games for you. Good coaching does. And I think sometimes people look at his personality and say he can't be a good coach. Folks, he is. And he's done it here today. And that last drive was just a clinic on play calling, I think. No surprise to me. I've been a great supporter of Earl Bruce. Take a look at his record. He has the best record in the Big Ten since he's been in there. People don't realize that. Aggies trailing by 15. Kevin Murray looking for a spark. Comes left side and overthrows his intended receiver, Shea Walker. Don't count AM out of this one, though, because as we pointed out a little bit earlier, they're a very good come-from-behind team, and when you have as talented as skilled players as they do, you have a chance. They came from behind against Baylor and SMU, this year. They were down to Baylor 17-0 in the first quarter, winning that one 31-30. Well, they've been more of a possession type of attack. They don't throw deep that often. They don't gobble up the yardage in big chunks. You see here, 9-2 and two the last two years when opposition scores first. That's very interesting. A lot of football to play yet. <laughs> but you don't need a 340-pounder jumping offside. You get out of his way, don't you? See the Buckeyes back up? My goodness. <laughs> be a new dance the Buckeye backup and I was amazed when they started to talk about how uh, Jackie Sherrill was talking about how quick he is at that sp at that size it's unbelievable you know he looks like to me a little bit and Doug France is going to take some uh, objection but he looked like Doug France when he played Ohio State a few years uh, back and then with me with the Rams but very light feet for a man 340 Sherrill says he plays like he's 240 pounds and if you believe that, folks... <laughs> Light feet, huh? We got a couple of bridges we want to sell you. <laughs> I want to know when he's going into the backfield. Those are size 16 Hummers down there. Light feet. 
Second down and 15. 7-11 to go third quarter. Swing pass right side. Calvin Whitfield tries to clear the way number 54 for Roger Vick, but Scott Leach, number eight, was there to make the tackle. The response to the Buckeyes has been great defensively. It looked like that thing was set up, but, unfor but for, uh, unfortunately for the Aggies, the support of the Buckeyes came right in and closed it down. That's Jim Helms, who was a great running back at the University of Texas back in the 60s. Offensive backfield coach and Jackie Sherrill. They're trying to solve the puzzle, and they haven't been able to thus far. It's third down at 13. Murray has a man, Shea Walker. That's good for an A&M first down at the 37-yard line. What they needed. And it, era, the nice adjustment again. If they take away Bernstein and Woodward, what do you do? You go right outside to Shea Walker, number 85, who's been a possession receiver. The key, though, was the protection. No pressure there on Murray. Ohio State decided to drop back and play coverage, and Walker, she Walker, found the, the uh, open zone there. Well, you finally got Bernstein and Woodward. Did I? <laughs> yeah, you did. Washington Post will love me. You retired the trophy. <laughs> Here's Roger Beck, knocked down at the 35. Aaron, I've been backing away from that for two and a half hours. <laughs> Let's go down quickly to Pat O'Brien. You know, you guys were talking about Earl Bruce's outfit. He looks like a young Mayor Daly on the sidelines. Well, let's give Jackie Sherrill some equal time. Have you ever wondered why he's always wearing a white shirt? Well, he always wears that white shirt. 21 of the last 25 games he's won with that shirt on. He says he's also got a coat that's 33 and 3, but it's all broken apart and he can't even get it on anymore. <laughs> let's go back upstairs. <laughs> it's Kevin Murray. Finds Bernstein to the 41-yard line. Chris Spielman and Greg Rogan with the tackle. You know, Era, if Kevin Murray will just look the Ohio State defense off because those inside linebackers are watching him so much like he did there, I think he has a chance to come back and throw underneath. There he looked to his right. The linebackers ran to the right, and then he came back to the tight end. I think that's a good point because he has favored and had the tendency to hit Bernstein and look for him and also Woodside. Aggies have had a real problem on third down. They are two of nine on third down conversions in the game. And the Buckeyes are threatening a blitz. Here they come. Murray reads it and overthrows an open Rod Bernstein. Well, that's, uh, he's rushing it. Feels as if he's got to get rid of the ball when they're coming. Rod Bernstein, top of the screen, he is the tight end but they split him out some. He actually ran in the slot there from the regular tight end position, but he got the inside pressure by Scott Leach. Number eight really caused the overthrow. There's the punt by Todd Schantz and the fair catch called by Everett Ross. So the Ohio State Buckeyes have held, and they hold on to a 21-6 lead with 4.51 to go, third quarter in the Cotton Bowl. We're live from the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas on the first day of 1987. The Buckeyes of Ohio State, the first Big Ten team to play here, have been impressive, and so has Earl Bruce. You know, he may have had a good point, and I'm talking about Earl Bruce when he said it's possible that the Aggies had not seen the equivalent of a passing game such as Carsadas and Carter and company, and thus far, it's been true. Carsadas so far, 9 of 13 for 186. Left side, Cooper, huge hole. Opened up by Bob Maggs, Jeff Ulamake, and Joe Stasniak on the left side of the offensive line. Looks like someone's hurt down there. That's an Aggie. You can see the power, and watch a blocking right here. There's Cooper going through the hole, but there's no one there to tackle him until he gets into the secondary. And he is a load going in there at 246. Boy, Aaron, Jeff Ulenake, number 68, really sealed off the inside very well for Cooper there. Injured player is Gary Jones, and he'll be replaced by Rodney Anthony. Of course, Ohio State started off losing to Alabama by six, and they were blown out by Washington. Tough to rebound from that kind of start. But Chris Spielman was asked, how did Ohio State manage to come back and win nine in a row? Well, I think that shows uh, the type of character, the type of pride that we at Ohio State have. And uh, I think the key to that was that uh, Coach Bruce and, uh, and his coaching staff kept confidence in us. In turn, we kept confidence in them and, and uh, we had good leadership. And, uh, you know, it's a matter of falling on your face and getting up and fight. And uh, 
I know a lot of people around here like are fighters. Well, they've shown that not only in the nine wins and the narrow loss to Michigan, but here before this sellout crowd and that pass from Garcados to Everett Ross was incomplete. And I thought there may have been pass interference by Alex Morris, number 30. The official interpreted it as being uncatchable error, but I think so. it looked like he tried to tackle him. I never can figure out why they say it's uncatchable. If you tackle a guy, of course he's not going to catch it. I'm going to get anywhere near it. Huh? <laughs> right. You don't speak to, to that from an offensive yeah, perspective, I do, do I do. I, I admit it. I've got a bias. Second down and 10. Looks threatened by the Aggies. Rodney Anthony, number eight, is in the lineup now. Torrington on the sideline. Here's Carsados. Ooh. That one is picked off. Out of bounds. Incomplete. Jeff Holly, number two. Yeah, it looked like he was out of bounds. There's that favorite tailback action. Take the ball to Workman. Steps back. Now he goes for the sideline here. And Holly, I think, is out of bounds here as he catches the ball. He jumps up. Yeah, I see. Way up. No question about that. Even I could have called that. <laughs> <laughs> but you would have argued for the interception, though. If you're one of your <laughs> well, players. Admit it. Admit it. <laughs> no, if it had been my, my guy intercepting, he was inbounds Absolutely. by four yards. Of course he was. Third and ten, Ohio State. They lead it 21-6. Jim Carsados, four-man rush, he's hit, gets rid of it, and it is dropped. John Roper, number 83, put terrific pressure on Carsados. And Ohio State will punt, and the Aggies, who have been standing throughout, began to wave the white towels. Tom Tupa back to punt. Still plenty of time in the ball game with 4.13 left in this third period and 15 minutes yet. A lot of time for the Aggies. Cooper's second punt had a very poor punt into the wind off the side of his foot to open the ball game. Rod Harris waits for it. Mm. Oh, wow. Wow. Now what? Harris. Uh, ooh, ooh. At the nine-yard line. Never feel the ball inside the 10-yard line. That's one of our favorite rules. Should have been followed. 58-yard punt, six on the return. <laughs> 4 one remaining third quarter. Ohio State on top, 21-6, and they have the Aggies backed up inside their own 10-yard line. Bert Lundquist, Eric Parsegian, Pat Hayden. We've got Pat O'Brien and Jim Nance with us. It was an early lead for AM as Scott Slater kicked a field goal to make it 3-0. But then Ohio State put together an 80-yard drive. Carsado's got a three-yard touchdown run after a couple of fine passes. That made it 7-3. It was 7-6 at the half and 14 points in the third quarter already for Ohio State. Mm. Uh, Roger Vick mm. gets the handoff and he gets out to about the 12. And that's all she wrote is Mike Roger Sullivan, number 67. Helps make the tackle with Scott Leach. Era, Daryl Lee is really playing well on the front. In the Go front back. three for Ohio State. Again, once again, penetration into the backfield altered the course of the running back. Anytime you get immediate penetration in the backfield, you're going to have some problems. He's done that on three or four occasions. He's given Trace McGuire and Lewis Cheeks the right guard and right tackle a bad time in there. Second down and eight, 329 to go, third quarter. Draw play. Roger Vick, number 43, out near the 20-yard line. Now that's a play we have not seen really from AM yet today. A little draw play, one way to slow down some of that rush that Kevin Murray has faced today. A good call. Puts him in a second and short situation. Third and short, excuse me. Take a look at the total offense for the two teams. Rushing Ohio State with 68 yards, but 219 passing. And the Aggies have gotten 120 on the ground, most of, most of those from Roger Vick. But the passing attack hasn't been there as we thought it might today. And the Aggies have only been giving 257 yards a game, and the Buckeyes have surpassed that already. Well, Kevin Murray has seemed a little tentative ever since that interception by Spielman for the touchdown, too. That's a first down for Texas A&M. That will be their 13th first Go down of the ballgame. They've got it at the 19. He has got a very strong right arm. He's a tough competitor, brings his team from behind, but right now he is hurrying his passes. First and 10, final three minutes, third quarter. On first down, flips it out, Roger Vick. Mm. 
to the 33 yard line. William White, number 37, made the tackle. And let's go down on the sidelines to Pat O'Brien. All right, Vern, a special guest, Y.A. Tittle, who was inducted into the Texas Sports Hall of Fame. Why, let's talk quarterbacks for a minute. What do you think of Kevin Murray? Well, I think he's a fine quarterback. He's getting a big rush right now. Uh, I haven't really seen him play this year, and I've heard a lot of good reports on him. Uh, I've always felt that the best way to stop a passing attack is put the heat on the quarterback, and Ohio State's doing a very good job right now. Okay, quickly, who do you like in the Super Bowl? Well, I think the two best teams are playing this Sunday, and that's the fourth. 49ers and the Giants. <laughs> I, think, I think the two best teams, the 49ers and the Giants, are playing this weekend. One of them, one of them will be eliminated. I really do, and uh, I play for both teams, and I wish both of them could win, but obviously they can't. Okay, Wally. Well, thanks for joining us. Happy thanks, New Year. Thanks. Let's go back upstairs. We almost got hit by the ball there. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice dodging there, Pat, and Wally. There's only one certainty here on New Year's Day, that Earl Bruce and Wally Tittle did not go to the same <laughs> store for their hats. <laughs> you know why YA's wearing that thing to keep that head warm. <laughs> I noticed you had one in your suitcase when we oh, walked yeah, in. Oh, yeah, the little monkey's bottom back there. Second down and ten. Roger Vick looks for a block downfield, gets it on William White, and is out of bounds at the 41. Chris Spielman comes flying across to make the tackle. This is one of the first times in this game that I've seen some decent sequencing of plays here by a and We saw some power inside with Vic. Then we saw a little dump pass to Vic, and then the option to, to the outside again. I, I like to see the sequencing of plays there. A little draw play in there also at the start of this drive. We spoke earlier about the 29 tackles that uh, Chris Spielman had in that Michigan game. That's just uh, an overwhelming number. Third and two with 2.17 to go third quarter, and the Aggies trying to get something ignited. Kevin Murray. Incomplete. It'll be fourth and two. Woodside could not hang on. Well, I'll tell you what. It's third and two, and I know A&M is a controlled passing attack, but that's the time I like to give the ball to Roger Vick, 230 pounds behind Marshall Land, 340, and try to pick up two yards. With 25 years of coaching experience, I agree with you. <laughs> But it's an incomplete pass, and now Todd Schantz, the fifth-year senior, is on to kick. That is an excellent punt into the wind. Everett Ross, the 19, and is down at the 25-yard line. Everett Ross on the return. Tackle made by Basil Jackson. 40-yard punt, eight on the return. The NFL today, coming up Saturday. Jim McMahon will be on live. Bobby Bethard, the Washington general manager, will talk about the Redskins' injuries. And Brent Musburger and Terry Bradshaw will enlighten you as to what to expect in the playoff game. Then on Sunday, Bill Walsh's game plan will be uh, dissected. Irv and Will report from the field. And Brent and Dick Vermeil will be there. 12 o'clock Eastern time on Sunday. Jim Carsados, 9 of 16 now, hasn't hit his last three passes. First down and 10. Good formation to the left side. They come to the short side of the field. Vince worked for number 42, and he's out to the 26-yard line. By Ohio State using Nate Harris in motion an awful lot, again, what it ends up in having Chris Carter in the slot right there when, although they ran the ball, Carter got single coverage. Nate Harris has been used a lot in motion era coming across the backfield. Yes, <clears throat> and if they can get him singled up, look out for a big play. Now he's going wider this time, so it does, it's unlikely that he'll be outflanked by Harris this time. Second down and nine. Option play, Carsados pulls up and goes deep into double coverage. Oh. And ill advised pass for quarter deep as Alex Morris was the closest man to the ball. Uh, just weren't coordinated that time. I think that Carsados thought he was going to break to the inside. They just got confused, I think, with the routes that they were running. You mentioned that Jim is a, in his, take a look at it again. Well, Jim Corsato, the dangerous position playing this position quarterback, and why so many quarterbacks get hurt is because of after, after they throw the ball, although that wasn't a big hit, sometimes you can go down in a heap and get some funny people rolling into your legs, and you see a lot of quarterbacks, even though, though they don't take big hits, getting hurt. Those are Aggie fans. Third and nine, 119 to go third quarter, 21-6, Ohio State leads. Nate Harris in motion to create the flip formation. They try the draw play. And Workman is buried by Todd Howard, number 73. Now in the Michigan game, Ohio State 
after really having a sensational first half, turned around and got conservative and did not possession the football. And of course, Michigan took control. Now, this is another example of it here. They were trying a draw, didn't want to take a high risk play. Todd Howard, number 73, came in there and made the play. But I think Ohio State's got to continue what they did in the first two quarters, three quarters, if they want to win this game. That 58 yard punt you saw on the right of the screen was last time out. There Ooh. comes the rush for the block. There is no flag. There was contact made, but Jim Garvey was right on the spot. And there must have been a ruling that uh, Alex Morris was blocked into. Yes. The putter. He thought he was actually should have blocked it. And, at, and Corsado steals the rush. He sees 10 men up. And he gets the ball off, and then he gives you his Lawrence Olivier. He didn't get hit there at all, but he did give, give you the Lawrence Olivier and fell back. <laughs> Two Aggies hit one another. It's Alex uh, Morris again, number 30. I don't think that was a Lawrence Olivier. It was more like a Chuck Norris. <laughs> First and 10. Kevin Murray. Mm. Oh, he just yeah. has not been yeah. there today. Yeah. Well, how do you settle a quarterback down like that? One of the things you can try to do is just get some short passes to maybe a back a screen pass. He hit Vic a little bit earlier on a little swing pass. That can settle a quarterback down. What he needs now is to some, some confidence. You need to build that as a coach. Now, there's no question about it. He's rushing his throws. He had him wide open. He had no one to rush him. He, was, he could have run the ball for 8 to 10 yards and still threw the ball into the ground. Murray came into the game completing 61% of his passes. He's 10 of 25, come. and here's the blitz. That one's on target. Shea Walker. That is not a first down. Well, wait a minute. It might be. Let's see where they spot the ball. Good read and throw here by Murray as he reads the blitz. You're going to see a lot of people coming in, and he's just going to come down and run the outside route. The corner is playing an inside technique, which he has to, against a blitz. It's an easy throw and an easy catch. Good read by Murray. That is a first down for Texas A&M. 18 seconds to go, third quarter. Roger Vick, sweep right. Mm. Mm. High stepping again, another Texas A&M first down. And the clock stops with 11 seconds to go in the quarter while they move the chain. Well, once Vic sees daylight, he really takes it. He gets a nice seam as they pitch the ball out to him. And when he sees it, he turns right through it. Right there. A great block there by Woodside, number 33. And finally, number 27, David Brown, who's not that big, brings him down. In the last game of the year, Roger Vick rushed for 167 against the University of Texas. He's now gone over 100 in the Cotton Bowl. Roger Vick, 109 yards on 20 carries. And that is the end of the third quarter of play. Ohio State, with 14 third quarter points, has a 15-point lead. We're back at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, the 51st annual Cotton Bowl. It all began with the dream of Jay Curtis Stanford in 1937, Vern Lundquist along with Eric Parsegian and Pat Hayden. Ohio State came in as a slight underdog. They've really put on quite a show era thus far. They really have. They got 21 points on the board, but the Aggies have the ball at the 32-yard line. They're a come-from-behind team, and it's still anybody's ball game because they can score quickly, and the Buckeyes have got to continue what they were doing before, not button up and become conservative. And here's what the Ohio State defense right now, this is a very important series for them. For the first time in this half, A&M has some momentum. Chris Spielman and the boys have to come up and put it, shut them down. A sack, an interception, a big play defensively. And one point just to think about, subjectively perhaps, that 14, 15 mile an hour win will be at the Aggies back all quarter long. First down and 10 from the 31. Flag is down, Roger Vick is two. Roger Vick, the ball carrier, flags down on the play. For the last two or three exchanges, there have been some, uh, some heated exchanges between both players, and you can guess who's in the middle of it, Chris Spielman. <laughs> no surprise there. See what the call is. He is definitive, isn't he? I'm telling you. Texas a and being called for an illegal shift. Yeah. Now some teams just have that 
that leadership, when they get ahead, they're just, they just refuse to lose. I sense Ohio State is that kind of team. Shift. Two men moving on the offense, decline. Second down and nine. Real good front runners for the Buckeyes. Well, that's not front runners. Well, that's well-conditioned, determined people. Ahead. I understand. That's uh, what I meant. Come on, that sounds like a Trojan. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that, coach. And that sounds the like legend. A, uh, <laughs> that sounds like a Notre Dame coach. All right, let's go. Here we go. Chris Spielman, second down and nine. Twenty-one-six. Ron Harris out of the backfield. The wide receiver, Murray, wings oh, it, wow. intercepted. Eric Kummerow. One time a high school quarterback. He asked to be changed the defensive linebacker, and he might be an All-American before he's through. Talk about different defenses. Can you believe this? Cumrose are leading sackers, tackles for the loss, and he drops off and picks off a ball. That's how very this defense has been. You see Harris in motion, number 17 there. Breaks across the middle, but this is a, a just another judgment call by Murray, who throws the ball directly to Cumrose. And a good defensive game plan, Errol. Uh, Kummerow started in a down position like he was going to rush the quarterback, then fell off into coverage. Third pass interception thrown by Kevin Murray. 14-25 remaining in this ball game. 21-6, and the Buckeyes have the ball back. The senior Jim Carsado's at quarterback. Here's the option. It's left, or right rather, and it's George Cooper, the fullback. Tackled by Kip Corrington, number 10. Here was the problem, Vern. Kevin Murray, this is Kumro down here. He is looking like he's going to rush the passer. But watch him fall off into coverage. He's going to fall right back in here, and Murray doesn't expect him to drop back in coverage. He looks like he's rushing. He drops back, and they, he thought, the quarterback thought, there was going to be a hole right there in the defense. Is that the case of a predetermined pass? Murray knows where he's going with it? He saw a hole there in the defense, didn't expect Kumro to drop off in coverage. First down and 10, Ohio State. And they'll utilize the fullback again, George Cooper, coming to the left side. Well, if there has been a story in this game, it's the Ohio State defensive scheme and effort throughout the day. And still 13.42 left to go, but Gary Blackney, the defensive coordinator, has done a remarkable job. I talked to him again last night, and he felt like they were going to camouflage their coverages. He felt confident. Well, I had looked at tapes, and we had looked at tapes, and we thought, boy, they're going to have a chore stopping this team. But thus far, he really deserves a lot of credit. Second down and seven. Motion again. Harris coming to the left side. Play fake. Carsados. Deep oh, left side. Oh, intercepted oh. by the Aggies. Alex Morris to the 42-yard line. He had him wide open. He overthrew him. It was a matter of execution, not strategy by the play. You look up here and you think, well, what kind of a play is this? But if you'll watch here... Carsadas, one of the few times this afternoon, makes a bad throw. He overthrows right here. You'll see a tremendous attempt. I couldn't quite see who that was. I guess it was Alex Morris picked the ball off. But it was just a matter of Carsadas overthrowing the ball. And a first down for the Aggies, trailing by 15. The inside handoff to Keith Woodside, number 33. And he runs as he has so often today into the arms of Spielman and Michael Key. There's Alex Morris, Boy, number 30. He, he has played very well today. We've seen him rush Carsados from the strong safety position, put some pressure on him on the blitz, and there he comes up with the interception. Almost blocked the punt as well. That's his second interception this year. Thinking in terms of the offensive coordinator, then Amadi, are you going to get a little nervous about Murray throwing the ball or are you going to try to run it in? Because he's thrown three interceptions already. You see, there's two runs in a row. That's a toss to the right side. Woodside, again, the ball carrier for the 37. 12 and a half remaining in the game. But, Aaron, you made a good point earlier on. When you have a possession type of passing team like AM does, the secondary really doesn't respect too many deep throws. They are crowding the receivers of AM. Third and five. Third defensive change now for Gary Blackley's Ohio State defensive unit. By the way, his wife, Loretta, is hospitalized back home. She suffered an aneurysm some three or four months ago. We want to wish her and the rest of the family well. And here come the Aggies on third and five. They are two of 11 on third down conversions. Four-man rush, good pressure, and Murray bobs out of it. Looks for a block and gets it. There's going to be a clip, I'll bet you. 
at the 30 yard line. And that will wipe out the first down. Oh, I bet you uh -huh. I was wrong. You want to take that back? I sure do. Re-rack the tape, man. Well, Rod Bernstein, number 29, he does get hold. He's a tight end coming up the oh, line of scrimmage. That's Ray Jackson. Oh, yeah, that is a clear hold. 47, Ray Jackson, a nickel back. Holds him twice. <laughs> Not just once wasn't enough. So he gets him a second time. Uh, well, well, he, that ought to be 30 yards or something. I don't know. Look like a couple of marathon dancers. <laughs> he couldn't even stay with him trying to hold him. <laughs> LSU leads Nebraska 7-3 in the Sugar Bowl in the second quarter. Our score is 21-6, Ohio State. But Texas A&M on the defensive holding call now has a first down at 22. High formation. Woodside trying to, trying to follow the block of Roger Vick. Goes left into the uh, tackle of Michael Key, number 30. See this thinking now? The Aggies now are keeping the ball on the ground. Even when Murray was back, Attempting to throw, he ran the football. He didn't think anybody was open, didn't want to take the chance. But they're trying to grind it out because I think they're a little shaky now because of what Murray has done thus far. He's been off target, a little bit off his timing. He needs a pass completion to get his confidence back again. I don't know how much effect it might have had on his concentration or effort today. Kevin Murray did have the flu earlier this week. Complained about not feeling very strong. Second down and nine. Murray with terrific protection. Marshall Land <laughs> won't let anybody close. There's the pass that's dropped at the two. Tony Thompson, number 80. And it may have been just a little behind him. Looked like he should have had it from up here. Well, Kevin Murray here, Era, did show some patience, which he hasn't shown. Only three men rush, eight in defense. He looks right, and he's trying to find it, but now his receivers have to work back to him, give him a little bit of help. The ball was thrown behind Thompson, but it was catchable. In the meantime, look at the tight end, Rod Bernstein. Help! Help! He's got to work his way back to the quarterback, though. When your quarterback's in trouble, any receiver has to work himself back to the QB. Third and nine, the option play, Kevin Murray. Oh! Go lay it up. That's a great play. Everybody came to, for the pitch. They thought he was going to pitch the ball. As he comes down the line, the support by the secondary is immediate, and it's going to be stopped. But Murray hangs on to the ball, fakes it, and then steps inside right there and runs right down to the 10 five-yard line. And give Lynn Amity, the offensive coordinator from AM, some credit here. That's the first time we have seen the option play where Kevin Murray has kept it on a third and eight situation. Rod Harris goes way to the left on first and goal from the five, and Ira Valentine, number 42, has joined Vic. Here's Roger Vic, does a fumble. somersault, fumble. Bernstein apparently has recovered for the Oof. Aggies at the 11. Well, he was hit in there, Whoa. too. Unbelievable. He was spun around. There was contact. That was a great job of defense. Mm. Let's see who really gets that pop on him. He just turned Vic right around. Wow. Sonny, Gordon. Sonny Gordon coming yeah. in there. Oh. Well, he has played well off the corner all day long. Bernstein, I, I tell you, Bernstein did a nice job of being alert and getting the ball. Well, Rod Bernstein recovered the fumble. The Aggies have called time with 9.56 to go in the game. CBS Sports presents the 51st annual Cotton Bowl Classic. Today's game is sponsored by Cotton Incorporated. Take comfort in cotton. Merrill Lynch. To Merrill Lynch, your world should know no boundaries. And by Mr. Goodwrench. No one knows your GM car better than Mr. Goodwrench. No one. We're live in the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas, first day of January in 1987. Ohio State Buckeyes leading Texas A&M 21-6, just under the 10-minute mark. The Aggies have the ball, second down and goal from the 10. And Era, might they think if they get in about going for two? Oh, I'm sure they will. They've got six points on the board, and I think they're going to have to pass the ball to get it in unless they run Murray on the option again. They've got to get the 14th point on the board if they score. And I think it's important on this drive that they get it in because it's 9.56 left. 
Well, if they go for two, they've had four two-point conversions this year. They converted three of those. Four attempts, and they converted three. Rod Harris goes wide left again. You look over the shoulder of Michael Key, who's had an outstanding game. Now Harris, the motion man. A three-man rush, four-man rush this time. Murray in trouble. That'll be intentional grounding. Eric Kummerow, number 14, who had an interception the last time out. And Murray is helped to his feet. How's that hit? Uh oh well, mask. Face mask. That should be offsetting penalties because I think they called Texas for, or the A&M, the Aggies for, grounding of the ball. Unless that was... That may have been the cause for the grounding. Mm. That's it. Kumaroa. Yeah, what? you're right. It's one and the same thing. Eric There's Kumaroa. the mask. The mask is first. Yeah. He's still trying to get rid of it, but the mask is there in the first penalty. That's what we did not see was the face mask. It's one and the same person. So the ball's moved up. Second down. And it'll be a second down and goal from the five. Roger Vick to the two-yard line. And Chris Spielman, number 36, makes the tackle. Now here when you have a Roger Vick and you're knowing that you need a touchdown, you've got two downs to do it. I don't think you get impatient and throw the ball. I would take two rushing attempts to get two yards using my 220-pound fullback. Absolutely, and he's got to go for it on fourth down and not kick the field goal, but go for the touchdown. 9.20 remaining in the ball game. Third and goal from the two. Shea Walker goes left. Woodside comes in motion. Pitch out, right side, thick. Touchdown, Texas A&M. That's the 11th rushing touchdown for Roger Vick this year. Now the decision to go for two, Pat, what will they try? Well, I talked with Jerry, Shir uh, Jackie Shiro, and I asked him about his two-point play. His first one, what he would like to use is Woodside or his tailback in motion across the backfield out into the flat. He is the first receiver. If he's not wide open, he'll hit the split end on a corner route. But again, they've been very successful on two-point plays this year. Let's see if that's what they have in mind now. Woodside is lined up to the left. See if he comes in motion to the right. Here he comes. They look for him. He's knocked off his feet. They lob it deep in the end zone. No good. We'll go back and look at both. But first, Roger Vick's touchdown. Again, third and two. You give it to your 230-pounder over Marshall Land, the right tackle, 340 pounds. Watch the body lean. Again, he was leaning forward and just drove himself two yards into the end zone. Now on the two-point play, Woodside in motion. Right there, he is the key receiver. Ohio State does a great job. They play zone down here rather than man for man. And that, uh, that's why Woodside was open, uh, uh, covered quickly. Great defensive strategy by playing zone defense there. And it was Sonny Gordon voted the most inspirational player by his teammates who was shadowing Woodside, forced him to go a little farther outside, and did not quite get the two-point conversion. Nine ten to go. Watch the end of the two-point attempt as Keith Woodside is near the boundary. And it's such an important play, but it appears right as he catches the ball, watch this left foot right here. It appears that it's on the line and he's out of bounds, but that requires now two scores rather than one. What a big play that is and a tough call. And look at the position of the official who was looking right down at the line. Perfect call. He was very decisive about it. There is Kevin Murray, his team now down 21-12. Scott Slater will kick off, joined by his 10 walk-ons. Everett Ross to return. Oh. And a flag comes flying on the near side of the field. Everett Ross. 
Danny Belcar made the tackle for the 12th man kickoff team. Number 12. Flip. Here's Ohio another look. State. Excuse me, at the two-point play. The man in motion here, they're trying to have him run right out here. They're expecting man-for-man -man coverage, and they're going to get a little pick play on the coverage man. Ohio State does a great job. Watch him. He'll stay right there. And so there's no one there. So the, the man runs right into the coverage. And that was a very good defensive call by Gary Blackney of Ohio State. And after the penalty, it'll be first down from the 10-yard line. 9-0-4 remaining in the ballgame. Aggie defensive unit trying to urge this multitude of supporters from Texas A&M on. Ohio State, 21-12 lead right now. George Cooper, number 44, into Rodney Anthony and Larry Kiln. That is a big play there, Era. When your defense has just given up the score, and the, all the momentum is going for A&M, you give the ball to your fullback. The center, Mags, makes a great block. Cooper, 245 pounds of him, just kind of works his way through for five tough yards. Matter of fact, make it six and call it second and four with 8.35 to go. Uh, Two-point play looms really big because it's going to require two scores on the part of the Aggies. Jackie Sherrill trying to gain some emotional support from the crowd himself. Workman bounces to the outside, gets by Johnny Holland, picks up a first down at the 22-yard line. Chet Brooks makes the tackle, number 27. It's exactly what the Buckeyes have to do. Maintain possession. Run that clock down. Hang on to it. Don't give the Aggies any more opportunities if they want to win. The Aggies are saying, hey, we got to shut them down, get that ball back for Murray and company. Era, it's been there. It's been their ground and their passing attack that's worked so well for them offensively. Do they pull in the reins now, though, and go to the ground? Well, they did. They did a good job that time. With it. Getting the first down in two plays was a very, very good sign for the Buckeyes, but still... I think you'll see them crowding. I think the Aggies will start to crowd them a little bit. They had bad working uh, field position when they had to run the ball. They may open up a little. Jim Carsados. Here's the quick pass left side, Nate Ross. That time the attempted block by Workman doesn't work as James Flowers, Nate Harris, not Ross, did a good job of getting around it. Larry Kelm, number 65, from the inside, really put the stop on this one. Remember, this is the play they ran earlier when Workman, number 42, came down and blocked the corner. This time the corner comes up and takes the outside away, forces Harris inside, and Kelm, 65, makes the stop. Second down, 11. Harris has had a huge day for Ohio State. You should anytime you play opposite Chris Carter. That's a good point. That's right. Like being a second team quarterback. It's a good job. Second down and 11. Carsados audibles, and he's fighting the 25 second clock now. Calls time. Now one official threw a flag. Now he's going to go pick it up. Delay a game. That's not the right call. And Earl Bruce is on the field. He has every right to be. Carsados was trying to give him the sign that it was a crowd noise and he wanted discretionary timeout and he wouldn't give it to him. That's where I thought that other official was sneaking over there to pick up his flag. Versados turned to the referee. But the Buckeyes are not protesting very much. Carsados didn't protest very much. Tenth penalty in the ball game. We're under the seven minute mark. Second down and 16. Aggies are showing blitz. Larry Kelm, Holland are sneaking up in the line. See if they come or drop back. Brooks is coming. And they do drop back. Uh-oh. Oh. Oh. oh! Boy! <laughs> I think all three of us saw that at the same time. Terrific defensive strategy, though, by a and They baited Jim Carsados into the audible. He thought it was going to be a blitz. He audible to the quick out. And Jeff Holly, number two, read it all the way. Terrific defensive plan there. But not a very good reception. Oh. The execution lacked something. <laughs> Third and 16, 6.54 to go. Boy, that catch by Holly could have heated this ball game up in a hurry. You bet. <laughs> 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 
Barsados can't hear the uh, or can't make himself heard. He finally gave him a discretionary timeout. The, ref the referee tapped his head, took his timeout. And I was talking to Carsados about how he wants the play call. The key, though, here was when the, the five-yard penalty against Ohio State, it took them out of a rundown, put them into a passing situation. They'd never caught up. And Jim Garvey is talking with Johnny Holland as Earl Bruce looks on from the sideline. I think uh, Garvey, the referee, was asking Holland if the crowd really gets noisy to help him calm them down. And the Aggies are doing just that. The Aggie football team. Well, a second call could be a... They could take a timeout away from the Aggies. But the crowd doesn't allow them to run the play. Third and 16. And Carsados has every right to wait as long as he wants. He can't be calling audibles, though, with this kind of crowd. You see, the Aggie players themselves are trying to get the crowd to quiet down, allow them to run the play. And now the referee is saying, okay, go back in the huddle. They'll probably come back on the PA and announce that they'll be taking away a timeout if it, it, if it persists. The next time that we have to delay the game, Texas A&M will be charged with a timeout. Please cooperate. I like Jim Garvey for the last seven years that I've known him because he takes charge of a football game, and I think that's terrific. That's a terrific call by the official. That's the rule. <laughs> yes, no, no, but no. a lot of officials won't make that statement. Oh, I've never seen an official not make that statement. They're all marvelous, aren't they? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, but... Jackie is arguing with uh, Jim Garvey. I talked with Jim last night, and he hasn't done a Jackie Sherrill game. He told me that in quite some time, not since he was at Pittsburgh. He is asking. <laughs> Earl's happy. Well, Man, all, this is easier than playing at Michigan. It went, it went against him in his own ballpark against Michigan. Michigan did the same thing. Third down. Now let's see if Carcados gets it off. Now the crowd gets with it. Carcados on third and 16. Unbelievable. That's it's Carter, Carter, of course. Guess who? Jeez. Flag down. And that is way back at the 18. You know, you wonder why Jim Carcados forces the ball sometime because he really was pretty well covered. He drives him. And then the ball is, is actually hung in the air. It took an awful long time to get there. Holly is well defended, defending Carter, and he does he tips the ball away from the defender, then makes the catch. But it doesn't make any difference because there's a penalty. It's going to be called back. 26 is on the line, covering the 80. 26 on the line. Nate Harris. Made him ineligible. Let's see what. Now we'll wait for Jim Garvey to call it. Bruce is out on the field again. It sounds as if he said that Nate Harris was on the line of scrimmage, made somebody ineligible. That's two critical penalties. Uh, apparently he's saying something here about Nate Harris. And here's your... That's two on the line. Oh, I see. Here Three. he's calling. Here's, here is Harris here. And this is Carter. He makes this man ineligible. He's off. No, here is the tight end right here. He's ineligible. If he releases off the line, then it's an illegal formation because he's lined up on the line of scrimmage. He stays in. Now there he comes out. It makes an illegal play. They've got a good call. Good call by the official. And as a result, it wipes out the 20-yard first down play. And Ohio State now has a third down and 21. Jamie Holland starts in motion. Here comes the blitz. Carsados rolls out, puts it up incomplete. He was belted by a blitzing Chet Brooks. And Tupa will have to kick into the wind. The last time he did, it was a 23-yarder. Boy, big pressure from the outside. Carsados felt it all the way. He was lucky, really, that ball didn't get picked off. 
just the thing that you said, Pat, that run action pass down on your own goal line, you're back to the rushers, and he has no chance. Drop back and throw it. No play action fake. They're coming after it. 15 mile an hour breeze in Tom Tupa's face. Rod Harris waits at midfield. Oh, they have the return on all the way. That's a nice punt. Harris, no Ooh. fair catch, and is down at the 43-yard line. But the Aggies get the benefit of the penalty on what would have been a first down, a 34-yard punt, and the Aggies have the ball. We're live this afternoon on New Year's Day from the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas. Ohio State holds on now to a 21-12 lead, 6.32 remaining. Bert Lundquist, Eric Parsegian, Pat Hayden, along with Pat O'Brien. The Aggies get the ball back with a first down at the Ohio State 43-yard line. They need two scores. Two wide receivers left, one to the right. Reverse. And a terrific defensive job by Scott Leach to mess that thing up. Number eight. You know, they, they broke that play up. There was so much penetration that time. It looked like they were going to come back around for the reverse that time. Scott Leach really read it, stepped in the backfield. There was no <laughs> chance. And Murray did a nice job of trying not to force it and pitching the ball. Yeah, he could have created a fumble. That makes it a second down 11. Chris Carter looks on. Any doubt in your mind, he wants to play basketball. Here's Murray. 11 to 27. Oh. Fourth interception of the game. And it's the second interception for Chris Fieldman. Great players play great in big games. Chris Spielman has done that again today. Boy, this is a mark. another great job by Spielman. Number 36, the right side of the green screen right there. And look, look at him step. Again, this is a judgment play on the part of Murray, who has not had a good afternoon. It's a combination of two things there. Spielman's second interception might seal it for Ohio State. 5.50 to go in the ball game. Fourth interception thrown now by Kevin Murray, the uh, junior out of Dallas. That ties a Cotton Bowl record set by Joe Montana of Notre Dame in 1979. The good news for Joe Montana was that Notre Dame won that game against Houston 35-34. A first down now for Ohio State with a 21-12 lead. Workman comes left. And picks up a couple. Still 540 left. AM again has a shot. Unfortunately, the quarterback is not a confident quarterback right now, but the defense has to stop Ohio State, force a punt, perhaps even try to block an error, try to get themselves, give themselves a chance. And they just have two timeouts to work with. Second down and seven as the clock shows 520 remaining. Jim Carsado is playing his final game for the Buckeyes. And a hot first quarter. Hobson play to the fullback. And that'll bring up a third and six as we cross the five-minute barrier. The four AM pass interceptions have been critical. Spielman returned one for a touchdown. Another was picked off by Kumaro after the Aggies were inside the 30-yard line. And this one when AM had the ball at the Ohio State 43. Ohio State's turnovers obviously haven't been nearly as costly. This is the one down by the end zone in the first quarter. 4.35 to go in the ball game. Buckeyes lead it 21-12. Here's the reverse. Oh. Fumbled. Jamie Holland. Trying to get out of an Aggie jail. It'll be fourth down, and a and will get the ball back. It was set up, too, for a positive play. It was going to be a big play. Instead, it's a 23-yard loss. And field position, as a matter of fact, on that last Spielman interception, one of the big things about it is that the Aggies had great field position, and all of a sudden it changed, and I thought if they didn't have a turnover, a mistake like they just had for 23 yards, it would have to go 80 yards after they punted. 4-12 to go prior to the fourth down punt. Timeout has been called. Pat O'Brien in the Maslin, Ohio stands. That's where Chris Spielman is from. And I just spoke to Chris and he said he's having the greatest time he's ever had 
And you want to know why he's such a good athlete? Well, maybe there is something to that. Let's go back upstairs. He was in high school when that uh, when that picture appeared, and he was he was voted upon by the city the citizens of Maslin. His picture submitted, and he won the contest. You're familiar with what they that's were all right. About, huh? Yeah, yeah. Dorsett's I number on though. I mean, yeah. the bottom of the Alpo Kings. They put mine on a sack of grapefruits back in '48. It's fourth down. Watch the punt block here. And 28. Rod Harris waits at the 40-yard line. And again, the return is on. Tupa into the wind. That's short. Harris comes up, lets it bounce, takes an Aggie roll, and picked off. That was not touched. Jamie Hollins <laughs> thought, well, just in case. <laughs> what the heck? I don't blame him. You know, it's my last game. <laughs> Maybe they touched it. That's a heads up play by Hall. Wait the officials call you back. <laughs> <laughs> the official was looking at him like, what are you doing? <laughs> Timeout's critical now. The Aggies have one left. Four minutes remaining. Ohio State still with all three. And Kevin Murray plagued with interceptions. Oh. And now plagued up the middle by Darrell Lee, the senior from Columbus, number 95. Well, he was trying to fake a sweep or some such thing and slowed down. <laughs> he should have known the rush was coming on him. Woo. But Darrell Lee, number 95, has had tremendous penetration all afternoon. That's the third time he's been over Murray's back. He is beating Trace McGuire, the guard, very quickly to get himself in the backfield. Second down and 18. Four man rush, Murray. In between two defenders, and Keith Woodside makes the catch. But one of the keys, I think, fellas, has been the fact that until that catch, well, now with that catch, Bernstein and Woodside have caught six passes between them today. You know, A&M right now, in my estimation, should be up on the line of scrimmage calling plays because time is very much their enemy. They're wasting an awful lot of time in the huddle. Nebraska leads. Here it's third and 14, and Kevin Murray back to throw. Intercepted for the fifth time. That's a new Cotton Bowl record. It's Michael Key, and he's got one man to beat. Touchdown, Ohio State University Buckeyes. France on to try the extra point after the 49-yard interception return by Michael Key. In the 51-year history of the Cotton Bowl Classic, the previous longest interception return for a touchdown was that of Frizzer White. <laughs> Colorado against Rice in 1938. 47 yards for a touchdown. Darrell Lee, number 95, right here. He's going to get his arm on, on the ball as Murray is releasing it right there. That caused the interception. Darrell Lee has raised havoc all afternoon. Michael Key knocks Wizard White out of the record books and the Aggies into defeat. <laughs> 249 remaining in the 51st annual Cotton Bowl Classic from Dallas, Ohio State now on top 28-12. This, of course, is the first day of the year, but the last day of our college football coverage for this season. And a lot of folks have been very much a part of the overall coverage for the season, and we'd like to thank them. We go back, Pat and Era, to the beginning of the day, and I think all three of us felt that the, the test was going to come for the Ohio State Buckeye defensive unit under Gary Blackney's leadership, and boy, have they responded well. I think we were all on top of the, of the story here, and Gary Blackney's defense, and I wasn't sure they were going to be able to do it because this team had been so efficient during the course of the year, but you go back to the statement that Earl Bruce made, he wondered whether or not 
the Aggies had faced the equivalent of the passer and the receivers that he had on this ball club. And Vern, A&M really didn't adjust well. Once, once Ohio State took Bernstein and Woodside out of the game, they really didn't do a good job of getting the ball to the other receivers who were open. And you saw the last credit there. It uh, was that of our executive producer, Ted Shaker, who along with one of our vice presidents, Peter Totorisi, are with us at the Cotton Bowl down in the truck. And they have been key figures, not only in our continuation of college football on CBS, but the acquisition of new rights for the NCAA television contract in college basketball. Here are the Aggies coming back, and uh, Rod Harris slips and falls at the 31-yard line. Well, Jackie Sherrill's had a very good year with this A&M team. Obviously, he's good. this one's going to end in disappointment. He's got a good offensive team coming back next year. He loses a lot of defensive players off of his ball club. Yeah, I was here a year ago, and uh, I think the Aggie team of a year ago was better than this. Of course, Jackie even said so. It wasn't quite as good, but they did win the conference championship and won a lot of close games. And Kevin Murray is going to get to rest the final 246. The new quarterback now for the Aggies is Craig Stump out of Port Arthur, Texas, where he was a high school senior, one of the most widely recruited quarterbacks in the state. Tackle is, uh, or the uh, handoff goes to Roger Vick, number 43. And the other side of the coin for the Buckeyes, they don't lose many players. Uh, Lee, who has played very well here, is the only down lineman they, they lose. Key, the linebacker, is the only one they lose. And, of course, Gordon. The rest of them are back on the defensive side. That is an incomplete pass at the 42-yard line intended for Shea Walker. There's the all-conference tight end, Taggart. And the rest of the Buckeyes. They have been very gracious in their acceptance of the hospitality of the Cotton Bowl folks here. The Cotton Bowl this year, the chairman of the board, Jim Ray Smith, and the president, Dan Petty, and, of course, the Hoss. The uh, Jim Brock and what a job they have done in providing hospitality. We've heard it over and over again from the Ohio State uh, traveling party. How graciously they have been received on their first trip to Dallas. And the Scovels as well. Field and his wife Mary and son John and daughter-in-law Diane. Keith Woodside, number 33. That's the flip to the 29-yard line. Well, just to show you how good Ohio State's defense has been all day, you would think they would be laying back in a prevent type of coverage, but AM is dumping the ball off, and you're still seeing four and five white jerseys around the ball. Todd Schantz on the punt on fourth down. Final two minutes of the 51st Cotton Bowl Classic. Everett Ross, sophomore number five out of Columbus, Ohio, makes the catch at the 26, and the Buckeyes will get it back one more time. Well, the seniors at Ohio State era really have had a terrific four or five years, too. They've, of course, been here in the Cotton Bowl. They're co-champions uh, of the Big Ten, been to four different bowls. Matter of fact, in, in playing here today, they become only the eighth team in college football history to play in all four of the previous major huh. New Year's Day bowls. Who else? Notre Dame has done it. Yeah, that's exactly. I a lot knew. of people don't realize I could have guessed Texas Lutheran, but when, they, when you looked at me, I figured it was Notre Dame. Well, they did play in the Rose Bowl, and a lot of people don't realize that. Of course, the rest of the bowls, the major bowls, the sugar, cotton, and orange, since the bowl ban was broken in 1969 uh, when I was coaching there. First down and 10. Dive play to George Cooper. And Earl Bruce's team is going to finish at 10 and 3 and break that uh, streak he had. It's a very good streak of 9 and 3 records. But they'll be a happy bunch traveling back to Columbus. And now 15, 2 and 2. They are also, by the way, 3 and 0 oh against Texas A&M. They've met twice previously, once back in 63 and again in 70, but both of those were in Columbus. Bill Matlock comes in now, a sophomore from Columbus, number 11. And they'll run from the straight tee on second down and seven with 105 remaining. Jim Bryant, freshman. Three full years ahead of him in a Buckeye uniform. And that'll bring up a third down. Well, he is back next year and obviously a lead. And they have two contenders really on the Ohio State team, I would guess, for not only All American honors, but the Heisman Trophy as well, Era. You bet, Chris Carter and Spielman, both of them had great years. 
and there's only three seniors that are lost from the offensive team. Taggart, Mags, and of course, Carsadas. The rest of them are all back. Final 30 seconds, and what of the happy contingent from Ohio State. Here's the pitch. Jim Carsados is down at the 33. One of the happy contingent, Rick Bay, the athletic director of Ohio State. He and his wife, Denise, are here. And it was uh, Rick and the staff that made the decision to come to the Cotton Bowl. And they have won it for Earl Bruce and the champions of the 51st Cotton Bowl Classic, the Ohio State Buckeyes. wear that hat forever. <laughs> then that suit and tie and shirt. That's right. Well, they used to call him old 9 and 3 Earl. Not anymore. Not anymore. 10 and 3 has a nicer ring to it. How about the day for Jim Carsados? 10 of 21 for 195 yards in his final game as a Buckeye. Enjoy the vacation in Acapulco, Jim. <laughs> Let's go down to Jim Nance, who's standing by with Jackie Sherrill. Coach Sherrill, it's got to be a disappointment not winning back-to-back -back Cotton Bowls, but this was not a typical Kevin Murray performance today. Five interceptions. We had five interceptions in the second half. You know, he's, there's no question that in the second half, uh, some of those interceptions, he was trying to force the ball in there and he's trying to get the ball in the crack. And, of course, the last one, his, his arm was tipped. I mean, and he, that was, that can happen. But, uh, you know, when you look, you look what, our football team and we played very well the second half defensively hung in there we had a chance we, you know, the ball was 21 to 12 and it went for two didn't go and then we still had a chance to come back but then you throw the interception you're throwing five you're not going to win a ball game what one thing do you felt turned it around what was the turning point well i think the biggest thing is, is throwing the interceptions you know turning the turning the ball over is probably the biggest thing but we're still in the ball game after even after three interceptions you know, but the fourth one kind of came back, but we still got the ball back, and and uh, you were out of it really, uh, going towards the, after the fifth interception. Coach, congratulations on a great season. Let's go back upstairs to Vern Lundquist. All right, Jim Nance, and the very happy Earl Bruce is standing by for the trophy presentation. Earl and the Buckeyes win the 51st Cotton Bowl Classic. We'll be right back. Final score here in Dallas on New Year's. Ohio State wins at 28 at Texas A&M 12. The Chevrolet most valuable players of the game are Chris Spielman, the linebacker from Ohio State, and Roger Beck, Beck the fullback from Texas A&M. A check in the amount of $1,000 will be donated by Chevrolet to each school's general scholarship fund to further assist qualified students in all chosen academic fields. Now, let's go down to Pat O'Brien. All right, Vern, thank you very much. We are in the trophy room, as we're calling it today, here on CBS with some of the Ohio State Buckeyes and Coach Earl Bruce. And Dan Petty, who is president of the Cotton Bowl Athletic Association, has a special presentation. Dan? Thank you, Pat. On behalf of the Cotton Bowl Athletic Association, Coach Bruce, we'd like to present to you and the Ohio State Buckeyes the Cotton Bowl Trophy for the 51st Classic and congratulate you on a fine win. Well, thank you, Dan. You know, it, it is a team victory, most certainly a, a great exhibition by our defensive football team, and we did score a couple touchdowns. I'm very proud of the Buckeyes today. They played hard and played well, and they just did a great job. They ran to the football, and can you imagine two interceptions for touchdowns by our linebackers? That's tremendous. Okay, now Coach Bruce uh, wore a, a suit and tie today and all that kind of stuff, but I think we got something else for your wardrobe, Coach. Coach, we have a special presentation to you, a cotton bowl jacket, official cotton bowl jacket to commemorate this fine victory in the 54th... Oh. 51st Cotton Bowl Classic. There he is. Boy. Thank you very much, Dan, and thanks for a nice time here in Dallas. Coach, what do you think? Well, I think it's a great victory for Ohio State, and, and, and most certainly we came out uh, and played uh, football today. A lot of things uh, happened in, in the football game, but we always fought back and, and uh, made adversity uh, and made some plays and, and did the job. I was very proud of our defense. They were put under great uh, pressure today by some uh, mistakes, but most certainly it was a great team victory, and we're very proud of that. And the Cotton Bowl, golly sakes, they've treated us tremendous. It must be hard to pick between the defense and an offense for your favorite players today. Well, I'll tell you, there's four young men right here that played their hearts out today, and that's what it takes to win. Let's talk to one of them. Chris, congratulations. You're the MVP of the game. What do you think? 
Well, it's just uh, uh, an honor for me. And, uh, you know, our defense had something to prove here when we lost to Michigan in the second half. And uh, we made a promise to ourselves that we're not, we're not going to let that happen again. And it was great team effort by both the offense and defense. And uh, I think we all played hard for our outgoing seniors. It was a great victory for everybody. In the fourth quarter, I came up to you and said, is this the most fun you've ever had, is it? It's, it's about to, it ranks up there, believe me, it ranks up there. Let's get Chris Carter over here, the leaper. What's your vertical leap these days? Uh, I don't know what it is about right now, but sometimes 33 inches. What do you think of this win today? It's a great win for Ohio State. You know, the first big team team to come down here and win the game, and for our seniors to go out on a winning note, which they came in on, it's just great for the university and great for our players. Let's bring Jim Carsados in, who had a great game as well. What does this mean for the seniors here? Oh, it's, it's a great feeling, you know. You, you really feel bad about leaving Ohio State, all your memories and friends, and uh, you get a chance to go out a winner, and uh, especially in a big bowl like the Cotton Bowl, it's really exciting. I think the young guys uh, played their hearts out for the seniors, and I thank them for that. What do you do to celebrate something like this? I'm going off to Acapulco tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny Gordon, how about you? Well, congratulations on a great win. Your thoughts? Well, you know, this this is the best way to, you know to go out as a senior. You know, we 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 all came in as winners, and you know, we are going out as winners now. Okay, let's go back upstairs to Vern Lundquist. All right, it was an Ohio State victory keyed by the linebackers' two pass interceptions for returns, one of which came from our Chevy MVP. This is Chris Spielman. He's got a year left, and don't Ohio State Buckeye fans love that? The junior All-American out of Maslin returned at 24 yards for the TD. He also had another interception. Mike Key returned a touchdown, 49 yards for an interception. And in all, the Ohio State defense turned out to be the difference in this game as they uh, forced five turnovers in the second half. Coming up on Sunday, it's the NFL on CBS. And on Saturday, the NFL on CBS when the Washington Redskins clash with the Chicago Bears in the NFC Divisional Playoffs. That begins at 12, 3.30 Eastern. And then on Sunday, the NFL today at 12 o'clock Eastern, Bill Walsh's game plan along with Brent and Dick Vermeil. Again, our final score, 28 to 12. This has been a presentation of CBS Sports. Well, as you saw, they came, they saw, and they conquered. I'm talking about the Ohio State Buckeyes. They faced the Texas Aggies today in the Cotton Bowl. The first time a Big Ten team has ever played in the Cotton Bowl, and Ohio State comes out on top 28 to 12. It was predicted to be a hard-fought ball game, as you saw, and Ohio State dominated play throughout the game. But Texas A&M, they were down 21 to 6 going into that fourth quarter, and they did come back, and they gave the Buckeyes a scare. But the Buckeyes are victorious 28 to 12 down in the Cotton Bowl. Now, many of you watched that game with friends at a party like the one that Dave Stanton is kind of crashing right now. Dave, and I imagine... Right, Dave, if you've got to work on New Year's Day, this is the way to do it. At a nice big party uh, cheering on the Buckeyes today to victory. So uh, we were at the uh, home of Mel and Hannah Collum and uh, Bexley, and they had a few of their most intimate 100 friends over <laughs> to cheer on the Buckeyes. Right now, we're uh, watching the Rose Bowl to see how the team up north does. We won't mention what networks that's on. Uh, earlier, of course, the game was going. Let's uh, show you some of the tape we shot earlier when all those... Oh, they get real quiet now. All those exciting fans uh, uh, watching the game you know this was a crazy kind of game today for uh, most of the fans uh, it was uh, either one minute they were deadly quiet because there was nothing going on or in the next minute uh, of course they were screaming and yelling because of uh, something good was going on so uh, that's pretty much the way it was here we had three different rooms with TVs in it and uh, the people were either uh, in one room were kind of wild another room they were uh, more analytic and in the, the big room they're in here they were uh, pretty wild let's talk to some of our fans here now uh, who are you my name is Hal Liner what do you think of the game I thought the game was great but what really impressed me was the way Earl Bruce was dressed. I really liked the way he was dressed. I liked that outfit, his new, his new hat. Uh -huh. Tremendous. I think he should wear that all the time from now on. He would be the best. We win every game. All right. How about this man? What's your name? Jerry Cruz. Jerry, what did you think of the game? I thought their defense was terrific. <laughs> You're a great fan. You were jumping up and down screaming here. It was exciting. I'm glad it's over. You like watching them at a party this way? Oh, absolutely. It's a lot of fun. All the friends. Mm -hmm. Well, Dave, that's pretty much the way it goes. Now, of course, there's a lot of people that are out there watching at the sports bars. Uh, we were at a couple earlier today. Take a look at uh, what we shot. Uh, of course, uh, Channel 10 uh, had the live show, uh, Countdown to Cotton On at Sportsters. That was uh, earlier today, right before the Cotton Bowl. And the fans there were kind of quiet. Woody Hayes, of course, was there. Uh, cheering on the Buckeyes. I'll bet he's a happy man today. Uh, like we say, the crowd, they're kind of quiet, but then uh, we went over to the scoreboard lounge, and they were a little more wild there. They were uh, kicking up quite a fuss as the Buckeyes were doing uh, well uh, in the first part of the game. 
So, Dave, that's the kind of day it is, uh, a Buckeye day all the way around. I bet you're a happy Buckeye, aren't you, Dave? Yeah, I think it was fantastic. <laughs> it really was fantastic. And the outfit that old Bruce had on today, everybody was talking about really, that. Really, yeah. yeah. He did look good, you know. Of course, if you're in Tom Landry country, uh, country you dress like Tom Landry, right? <laughs> yeah. Fans are going crazy. Okay. Thanks a lot, Dave.